has been a Wardam teacher for nearly 40 years. Experiences as a class teacher in Detroit prepared him to be a high school teacher in the United States. Encounters as a high school teacher readied him to work with students with different learning styles by showing teachers how to use the curriculum to create a viable learning environment for every student in the classroom. He worked with many different teacher training programs as well. Retired, retired in 2013, and that freed him up to work in China and Japan. He teaches the students in their classrooms. He works with the high school faculties to look pedagogically. Am I saying this right? You can correct me. Okay, perfect. So I learned something today at Waldorf's education in real time. I want to learn all about what that means today. So with that, take it away, Mr. Paul. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I need to make a correction just to begin with. It'll be my last one. <laughs> it says here that I'm a coordinator at the San Francisco Walker School. And they would be very surprised to I taught there for 10 years, and that's where I retired from. But I was a high school teacher there, and also at the end involved in um, working with educational support issues. But a coordinator, not so. I'd like to begin by one making a comment about yesterday. And I agree with everything you said. And I would say also that I felt very much at home here. Now, I'm a Waldorf teacher. Waldorf, as you will see, is not known for its attachment to technology, especially IT. We use it in the high school extensively. We teach it, but it is not our environment. So to say that here I feel completely at home must mean that I felt very much akin yesterday to what you do as part of Asha. And that's no little thing. And it doesn't mean that I feel that the Waldorf movement also has a lot of fundraising issues. Because we do. We do. Everybody should do. It doesn't mean that I felt at home with a lot of very intelligent people. Because frankly, the intelligence here is probably IQ-wise higher than what I'm used to. The brightness of it. So what do you think did allow me to feel at home? What do you think? You might notice I ask you questions. You're just not going to sit there. That's not going to happen. Uh, if it were grade school, I'd ask a question, and then I would distract myself a little bit, and I'd talk about something else. And meanwhile, you have these grade school students saying, What's the answer to your question? What's the answer to your question? Then I would distract myself from my distraction and come over here and speak a little bit more. And they anticipating something that I set up. Yes, why not? They're grade school. They have to be involved, excited. High school, I would do it pedagogically in the sense of using a form that allows me to connect with the audience. It would be platonic as it more or less was. What do you think? Let's have a conversation, because I'm not here just plugging information into your heads. That's not going to happen. Since you're adults, I will just give you about one minute <laughs> to think. That's where I give most people teacher training. So, you know, it's a compliment. One minute to what is, do you think, your basic approach to life that allows somebody else in an educational form to come in and feel at home. And your only clues are, yesterday there were three teachers at least who stood up and one on the screen and spoke to us about their connection with the children. And they all made the same point. And that's what made me feel at home. So you have a minute. That's 1 45th of the time I had to talk, so this is a compliment. So really think, yeah, what is it? What is it? It's going to be a teacherly minute, so it's got nothing to do with 60 minutes. <laughs> or 60 seconds. Anybody? That's your minute. Anybody? Yeah. 
helping child think freely, creatively. Very nice. Being there for the child and allowing the child to think creatively. Very good. But let's go a little deeper. What allows these teachers to do that and what allows you to set up the frameworks monetarily, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that does that. What's the human quality? So, so leadership. Leadership. Very nice. Very nice. It is. But what's the quality of your leadership? I've been led by people that basically all I'm glad is that they're in front of me so I can fall way behind <laughs> and be out of their lives entirely. And I've had leaders that I would follow. You all know that you, at one time in your life, have had a leader that made a difference. And if not, you wouldn't be here. Yeah, but... I think freedom to express and... Very nice. Freedom and expression. Very good. We will come back to this. Another quality. I'm so happy you don't know what it is because it's so deep. You just take it for granted. But you didn't bitch about it yesterday. But you certainly said, here's something we got to work on. Here's something we got to work on. Here's something we did work on. And we still have a couple on my list. You had a different word for it. I was going to say compassion. Compassion is very nice. It's as close as we're going to get before we actually come home to it. But without compassion, you can't have this quality that made me feel at home. And Gary Tipple, that made me talk about it. Empathy. Uh, empathy and compassion, brother and sister, this family affair. <laughs> no, that sort of, you know, back door. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no very nice. See how right everybody is? <laughs> and you all say, oh, I got it now. No, 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 no. That's just, you know, marrying nouns. Uh, no, no, no. Freedom, we've heard. Freedom, yes. You have the freedom to be selfless. You, as an organization, I don't even know if you know it, how selfless you are. It's in your structure. It's the basis of an argument. It's the reason you have such an economic output. Because you base your efforts on work that you give out into the community after you've done your full-time jobs or going to your classes. This is a complete uh, relationship to what we in Mulder expect from our teachers. Let me say just a few words about myself before we plunge into it. I think I've learned a few things as a Mulder teacher that's always very nice if you know something about the person who's speaking to you. Now, on a human level, we've had this already. Um, in China, they always want to know how old I am. <laughs> it's what they do, I don't know why. <laughs> and if you do too, just raise your hand. But otherwise, <laughs> I, mean, you I, I really don't know. Uh, but I've been a water teacher for a long time in grade school, meaning one through through eight, although I only taught from grade three on. Then high school for a lot, right? Then 11, 12, and then teacher training, and then schools around the world. So I've gone pretty much the gamut. In terms of a Mulder community, the faculty takes on a lot of responsibilities for running it, um, everything from uh, uh, fundraising committees to chairperson to board members and all of this. And I've, I've been part of all that, and that's not anything to do with what we're talking about. So I come to you with certain experiences, and I would like to uh, share some of those. Because of the selfless, education has always been a force. It has always been a force. There's always been this thought that in terms of societal relationships, and even if we get to the basic societies of family, that different people have different capacities and they can lead in certain ways. And over the, the thrust of civilization, we have seen this idea uh, form in many, many, many different ways. The Greeks had tutors for those who could do it. You, by, by take on the activity. 
we've seen that generally it creates, as was mentioned yesterday, and can create a spectrum of active people or inactive, and you call it yesterday the elite. This is part and parcel of distinctions made in education. Education has a The, the awful thing I heard yesterday uh, was that education is withheld from certain people. Um, to me, that's, that's, you know, if you have a misery quotient of how much you can handle every day, that pretty much takes care of two days' worth for me. Because to think that, that people who have a capacity to do something, and who knows what it is, are not allowed to do it is for me antithetical to everything that I believe and you too. It's astronomical. Until roughly 200 years ago, education was focused on the needs of society. But then society itself began to unleash a certain activity taken up by its members. Namely, there was a rise of people becoming individuals, intellectuals. From the Renaissance on through the Enlightenment, one had this notion that here is an individual, I can make a difference. That's what the Enlightenment allowed. And with that came a change in the focus of education. Namely, Education is not just the societal needs and frameworks, but actually it is best looked at, and that's the word metric, from the point of view of the one who is being educated. And you take this for granted, but it's not so that it was an old idea. Now that we have so much emphasis on individuation, of individuals, we see a consequent change in social activities in terms of education. It must be, because it highlights the issue of our time is really, when you get right down to it, how an individual relates to society. One creates the other over a period of time, called a lifetime, amidst the group. And the more conscious of it, the more we see we don't understand. These are modern times. I want to tell you about Waller's education, because Waller's education bridges very, very, very nicely this relationship between society and the nature of an individual. Waller's education began, oh, by the way, I have here. Uh, two handouts, feel free to take them. Um, this man, Waddle Kosh, gave them to you. I told him when I was coming here, he said, we usually sell this. He said, just, just put them out there if you want them, fine. This one is on Waller's education itself. And this one is on Rudolf Steiner, the man who initiated Waller's education. It's 1919, Rudolf Steiner is trying, at the end of World War I, to establish a way that nations will deal with each other. And he looks upon this not in a typical way, but in the fact that society needs to look at the fact that it has economic activity, it has legal activity, and it has cultural activity. He called this threefold. Ignored, basically ignored at the end of World War I, you know the Treaty of Versailles, written. Guaranteed World War II. You might as well just say post-grip World War II will arise in, in one generation under this nonsense. What did Rudolf Steiner do? He said, society is not ready to understand how it needs to work. Therefore, I'm going to start a school. However, he had to be asked first by a man named Emil Moltz, 
isn't there some sort of pedagogical, artistic way, academic way, that can be created that will lead to peace? So it was the question at the time. Everyone else I said, yes, there is. And then gave the outlines for Waller of Education. So we can think that the goal of Waller of Education is to create individuals who will work actively in a society as individuals, knowing they are not the only individual. The United States is crowded with individuals. I can tell you that right now, just visit. Crowded. Are they aware that there's other individuals only when they get in their way? <laughs> yeah. And then I, you know, I polish my elbows. This is not what Rudolf Steiner or anybody in their right mind is talking about as an individual. It's not selfishness. It is a community of individuals, a new idea. It's a new reality. It's what you are working with, whether you know it or not, out of your selflessness, helping others do what they can do and you, you can do. So, this seed that I just heard from my mother's. So, Rudolf Steiner develops a curriculum. He has teachers training. And out of his own life experience, deals not fundamentally with the curriculum, but the nature of the child. He, more than anyone else in the 20th century, looked deeply into what it means to be a human being, what it means to grow, what it means to be educated. And he said, and you can see that he's right, that if we allow individuals to emerge from our schools, then there will be changes in a society. This is now very commonly called child development. All of education is based on observations about child development. So I would like to just lead you through the growth of the child. You've seen all of this and compare it, put it into a pedagogical framework. That's as much as we can hope to do in the next 25 minutes. We all know a child is born more or less helpless. One of the most helpless mammals born needs what? Immediately needs society or it dies. You can take this as an archetypal image of the relationship that we will always, always have. Others provide for me my lifeline. Child doesn't forever stay that way. I don't see anybody here sitting on his or her mother's lap, so this is very good. <laughs> At the age of one, we know this. Especially if you're the father, a doting father, or a sensible mother, that the child, which has crawled, who has just crawled all over the place, you've already redecorated your house by moving everything to a higher place, you know. Especially you don't go to friends anymore, especially if they have valuable objects because you don't want to pay your work once they're broken. <laughs> and they crawl around and eventually, however, they stand up and they walk. When you stop to think about this, it's absolutely incredible that one moves out of the horizontal into the vertical and does what? That's where that, that walk. In terms of forces, what happens? Uh, it begins to uh, not consciously learn, but certainly muscle learn. Takes on, I mean, all our lives are taking on forces, confronting. We confront, that's what we do. And what force do we confront when we stand up? I mean, we don't, we don't look at the child and say, oh, finally, gravity is overcome. <laughs> you know? No, you don't do that. You actually, I, I remember my, my first wife was just screaming. 
<laughs> it was not really a scientific expression at all. Um, <laughs> just, whoa, and on the phone, and on and on and on, you know, okay, this is this very good. That's, that's, yeah, that's what it was. But that's what, what happened. So now you see that these moments are important. In fact, these moments are just pictures of an individual taking up a place on Earth. The first place they have generally is the family, but personally is a body, which they do not control. They just don't do it. The potty training is a lack of discipline. You can look at it that way. You don't do it right. Well, yeah, but I can't. At this stage, that's it. That's the best I can do. <laughs> yeah. It's always very interesting to see who is easy in potty training and who is not. And when you begin to look at children for what they're really doing, not to say, oh, he's what he walked, but oh my God, he walked, but he had a limp. How do you have your limp? How do you have your first test? There's a limp. What's going on here? You see a destiny of that child. What happens after that? What's the next? These are called milestones. And this is not anthroposophy. This is not Walter. This is everybody knows that. You know that. Your mothers, your fathers. What's the next step? Standing up at the blackboard and doing math? I doubt it very much. <laughs> yeah, but who knows? Maybe something. Yeah. Talk. talk. And not just make sounds, but talk. So as there are things crawling around and learning and Googling and gaggling and all those things, really it, it behooves us as, as, as human beings to introduce them as human beings to society. So the sounds that we can make, goo goo, ga ga, ba ba, all this. This is, I mean, unnecessary. These are not society sounds, unless you want to treat it like a sheep. But this is basically probably not what you're doing. So you talk, human talk. A little bit slower, maybe. Yeah. You know? But then they begin to speak. Again, it's taking on a force, it's taking on a new reality. When you think about it, and as a whole other teacher, we think about it all the time. I mean, you can get involved in every one of these steps. But that somebody takes on all the aspects of the language, doing it first, but eventually correcting himself within the framework provided by whom? Society. It's as an achievement beyond probably most of others. Not just Rudolf Steiner, but many say the first three years of their lives, they accomplish more, we accomplish more, than you will do for the rest of your life. That's a sobering thought, to think that you've peaked at the age of three. <laughs> yeah. And we, it's not a social forming thought, we don't generally do that. But in terms of what we've done, and what's the next step? We did this way, a lot of calls is willing. There's a lot of activity, and then you have a moment. And then you use that moment the rest of your life. And then we have this language. And of course, they lose it, this wrong, and eventually education is teaching is grammar, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I love grammar, by the way. But it's, it's taking what they already know, their language, and helping them think about it. What's the third huge, great milestone? Asking questions. Asking questions. Asking questions. Ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> in grade school, I would never say no because they crumble. You know? <laughs> like, uh, and in high school, in grade nine or ten, I said no, but I said no. <laughs> because that's how they need me. That's the problem. I said, no, what are you doing? You know, like, no, close. I mean, if, you know, if they needed this, I do different things. I'm sure. It's like, yes, yeah, right? Good. What? 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 You all did it. It's amazing. You all did it. Oh, I shouldn't start my back. It's a camera. <laughs> right? You right? Ah, no. This is really right. Correct, <laughs> <laughs> wrong. Uh, no, but change things. You You're say. You're recognizing yourself as an individual separate from you. Very nice. And oh, oh, that's absolutely right. <laughs> I see myself for the first time as something other than what I was before. We use the word separate. We use it in nations. We use it in everything. But it's hugely important. We separate ourselves 
from our own opinion about ourselves, not that we would ever use the word opinion with somebody that doesn't have any, they just have a life. And we do this, they do this, you all did this. I did it this way. Paul wants to swim, Paul wants this, Paul wants that, Paul wants this, mommy, 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 why can't I, Paul wants this. You almost regret that they learn language, you know, sometimes they don't just leave you alone. And finally, the parent will hear this, or, or Paul will say, I think, I want this. This statement of I is a separation. It means I'm here and yours, you, plural, English, I love it, used to be common, now it's not. Yours are something other than me. And we have here an archetypal picture of a developing human being. We also, and we don't have time to do this, an archetypal picture of developing society. Now, what's so interesting about this in terms of Waldorf education is that Rudolf Steiner gave us concepts to work with that these first, that an individual is actually a composite of willing activity, basically not control, so you can take the first year away, of feeling, and language is expression. Language is expression. And out of this expression, we know that we're thinking. Check yourself. You often, maybe too often, who knows, say things to the say, oh, that's what I said. So we have the thinking. This pattern is then repeated, repeated, over and over. Rudolf Steiner pointed out, as did others, but later, that development of a child, if you watch it, development of the human being, goes in seven year stages. The first seven years are generally spent at home or in the kindergarten or something, and the children are, if you look and you say to yourself, are they more characterized by this willing activity or this feeling or the thinking? You know it's not the thinking. And you know that their feelings are involved, but generally speaking, in terms of education, and this again within the last hundred years is a focus. In terms of education, we see that the children are building up their capacities to use their bodies. That's what they're doing. And neuroscience will tell you flat out that if they do not move, if they do not stay active, if they do not play, which is simply movement in my imagination. They will not, and here neuroscience becomes very mechanical for my case, they will uh, take the brain, they will shape it certain ways, and for the rest of your life, you will have them. Everybody knows that you need to take up the body before you can use it. If we do not, and it's only, I think, in the last 50 years that we have to be so uh, insistent to say what happens if this does not, you will find that children do not eventually, the next stage, when they're able to learn, they take up their learning, they cannot. Think of it as they're not comfortable in their house. When we see that there is a huge increase in what's called learning differences or learning difficulty, many in fact, most are traceable to the fact that this, this child becomes student. This child is not able to access all that the body would allow them to do. There are primitive reflexes that one must overcome or you cannot learn. As Science and natural scientists look at this first seven years. They notice also something, a benefit, yeah, at least a bequeath or death-oriented of, of the world we live in, which is nutrition, plays a huge role in what? Thinking. Early nutrition. That there are activities, not just out here that you can see, but actually inward, especially metabolic. 
metabolic metabolic. It's like I'm translating from another language. Metabolic, which is of course the most active element. There's even a term for it. I'll give it to you just in case for some reason you come across it and you wonder what it is. It's called leaky gut syndrome. Now, I think somebody with a sense of humor came up with this uh, designation, <laughs> but it means that the metabolism itself is causing a kind of poisoning of your system so that you can't find Organology and anything to do with organs are now seeing the results of this uh, lack of nutrition, this, this not taking up one's body firmly. Very interesting. Our society, yes, there's always the society, is creating itself in such a way that individuals are coming and having difficulty entering what their body is. And if that's the case, then their society. And we see over here the society scrambling to figure out how, because we love our children and we want to educate them. Next stage, we can call it grade school. No? Real science says there's a huge difference between a three-year-old and a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. It's really very interesting that a five-year-old is already in this third stage where, generally speaking, they can get into trouble by having an idea. Uh, then they're three or four, and you're working with the nursery. It's a world. But it's, yeah, I mean, and it's a tiring world. But it's not a tiring world because so it's just getting into trouble. But at the age of five, you can't call it trouble because they're so innocent. On the other hand, you can call it trouble because you had to spend six hours talking to the parents who, et cetera, et cetera, we saw have children who are crying because of this bit of cleverness over here by this five-year-old. It is this sort of awakeness that's taking out. But then they get into first grade, and seven, eight are so heavenly because they're actually your job as a teacher in the water is to take these individuals, let's say you have 25 of them, and what do you do? You work very, 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 very hard to make them into a class, a group, otherwise called a society. And some do it very well, and these you have to say, you know, Margaret, you say to yourself, Margaret's going to have to come out of herself a little bit, she's so fat all the time. But she'll do what I tell her to do, but that's not the point. She'll always do what people tell her to do, and she needs to stand up a little bit. However, she doesn't have to stand up as much as Kevin over here, who I can't get to sit down for the first half an hour of class. So you're always balancing this, and you're very happy if you can say to them, if you can say to the whole school, we're ready at the first assembly. And you know your challenge is to walk up there from sitting here in the auditorium, walk up on the stage and make a circle. That's a circle. And then they say a poem. And then they sit down. Now many male fathers do not understand the achievement of that. For anybody that sort of has spent some time with their children know that one, that's not what he ordinarily and she ordinarily would do. So you see, we're in a shaping because of this fluid. This is very nice, but what happens? Maybe somebody even has memories of this. I've often come across adults who do. What happens at the age of nine? The age of nine, grade three. If you have children, maybe it's a more recent. There's a crisis. It's a crisis, and it's this. It's comparable to the one where I'm separated. I give you an example of my son, classic. I lived in Toronto, and he and I would walk around the neighborhood. We lived in the Italian neighborhood. So, of course, within a week, he knew everybody, and everybody knew him. It was terrific. And we would just walk, and here I'm walking down the sidewalk, and Christopher is, you know, barely within sight, certainly within hearing, just all over the place, on the porches, meeting people. This is our walk. I'm preparing my lessons, and he's out exploring. Fine, I love it. What happens with this moment when they not just recognize they're different, the eye, but now it's a feeling. They become afraid. 
And what did Christopher do? For the whole year, he just walked with me. And I was holding his hand. And we're traveling in the state area. In your class, you will have children who will experience design your change, uh, sometimes radically, sometimes gently. It's important that they hear. I have to expedite this a little bit. At the age, grade six, at the age of 12, there's another change. And it's so interesting that I was talking to the coordinator of Youth Asha yesterday. And she mentioned grade six. And you remember, we talked about high school as well. And grade six is 12 years old. So if you take the seven-year pattern, you've got one through seven, seven through 14. The minute you get to 12, you know there's this transition from feeling, yeah? To I'm now going to be in kind of this thinking element, this more exploratory element of my own development. And it's not a racial development, it's around the world. So long as education introduces then labs for science and says, you can have your thinking and direct it to complete and accurate observation because they become very interested in the world. And some of your scamps will become very interested in the world in areas that you don't want them to become interested. That's called discipline. Others will just become full of all this interest, and it's so invigorating. And then they reach 14, in other words, high school. And what happens? It starts again, this seven year pattern. And you say to yourself, no, that's not true. Education is linear. Education is I teach them something in eight, and they know it in nine. I teach them something in seven and eight, and they definitely know it in eight and nine, or nine and ten, and I'm justified in being angry that they don't. And I can assure you that idea is fallacious. It is not so. It's just one of these ideas that we get that we think, since it makes sense, hell, it must be right. And it At nine, grade nine is always the most challenging grade in the four. They're just sort of out of themselves. And you can see that here they are again. We're going to be moving into this time when I'm teaching them how to think, and they're farthest away from anything you would consider logical, reasonable behavior. And if you're there in the school and you saw them in eighth grade, ah, you can really feel despair if you're young and a new teacher. And say, God, they were better than them. That's true. They were. That's true. It's not your fault. I had an eighth grade teacher once blame me for the behavior of her class that she had put from eighth grade into ninth grade. She just really lit out after me. Obviously, she didn't know that this is what needs to happen. Why does it need to happen? Because think of it, we have been working with these children and bringing them the whole world in the curriculum. They need to internalize it. But now, what is this third activity, this interest in the world, this thinking? It's making it my own. So it only makes sense that just as their body is taking off, just as adolescence is coming, just as puberty is here, it's the same activity in terms of our thinking. So they need to take all of this and remember it or not, internalize it, begin to shape it in different ways, which we called yesterday. We heard all kinds of different ways of cognition. Absolutely. Grade nine is this transition. As a high school teacher, they, they, you, you need to love grade nine or don't teach them. They really can be quite a challenge. They have a posture with the world, which is uh, thankfully not carried on for the rest of their lives, usually. Except I can point to a few politicians in the United States, and obviously. <laughs> and, uh, and you probably could too if you felt the need for that particular indoor sport. But I will not do that. I'm not here to compare. Yeah, well, I'm not even going to use nouns here. <laughs> We're not doing that. I'm not doing it politically. It's true. Uh, so there, I, I, I'll give you an example. I had a student, grade nine, came up. I, I do humanities. I do humanities. And that means writing. 
and he gave me an essay that he owed to me one time, and he already had graded it. A plus. <laughs> In grade school, this is just kind of them seeing one, how witty I can be, and two, can I get the teacher angry? That's, that's all right. And it, it's nothing more than that. And you just treat it like you know, residential nonsense. But, you, know, you don't make an issue of it. Ninth grade, be serious. I said, well, what if I don't agree with this? And he just looks at me like, what? <laughs> this concept was not, I mean, and, and he's not making it up. And you can probably remember your own. And it's just sort of, what do you mean not agree with me? <laughs> I, this is my best work. I checked it twice. Like that's some sort of magical thing. It actually it is. Uh, it's an A plus. You're in something like world. If you need help, by the way, with your life, just come around to other countries and advice is free. And that's the attitude. They have one mode of conversation, and that's assertion. I assert this, period, end of discussion. There is no such word as discussion. To argue with a ninth grader is just, you know, might as well sell your soul to the devil, because you, that's the end of it. You know, just, that's it. Grade 10, now it's a little bit different. Now it's different. They're a little bit more mature. We in Walmart meet them with walls, but we never tell them that this is wrong because actually they need to go through this. This is called adolescence. Adolescence is one of the great trial periods of your lives. I've heard many people in Waldorf and outside saying two things. One, you will learn more about social relationships in an adolescent period than any other time in your life. And two, it will bring you more trials than any other time in your life. It's called high school. You gotta love them in high school or just let it go. You go somewhere else. Because you're it's, it's out of way. Grade 10, they begin to look around and then we offer certain blocks that encourage them to look at their own growth of individuality. And we go right back to ancient culture, and then we go right back to a language and poetry and what lives in them has a history. And it settles them right down. So that this assertion, which is their, their, their sort of way of speaking, changes into a lot. They're not really yet ready for prime time, that's for sure. But instead of asserting, they will now at least argue with you. When they provide them, you know, and well, you have a good point. If you ever hear a 10th grader say that, say, okay, I've done my job. This is good. This is good. Can you, can you uh, uh, tell me the, the Assyrian kings in the proper order? Probably not. Can he do it? Yes. I, I don't care one way or the other, Frank. He wrote it down, so it's there. But if he can inwardly have a relationship with me in terms of our discussion, in other words, society and individual, that's it. 11th grade and 12 are different. 11th grade and 12, there's a threshold in 9 and 10, and that's in keeping with this cycle of we have this, this willing activity and then now this, this activity where I really consciously in terms of my thinking and dealing with my own responsible feeling is in grade 10 that in reevaluating my friendships most Friendships that have been in existence from grade four to five on change. And you might remember that. In grade 10, your best friend found other people who were interesting. And that was awful. And I found nobody at first, and that was even more awful. High school is this arena when I ask teacher trainers what they do mess about high school. Almost never do they tell me about a subject. And if they do, it's not the subject they're making their living in, which is even more interesting. They tell me about relationships. That's rightly so. Because relationships, individual society, these are synonyms, and I am really working it out now consciously, not like I did in grade school. 
11, we meet them with a curriculum that forces them to picture what they cannot actually see. We ask them to trust their thinking. Trust the mathematics and geometry. So that they are now being consolidated in the sense in grade 9 and 10. They're ready to take up one of the challenges of society, but still themselves. Because they are righteously self-involved. They need to be. It's when they're 40 years old and they're still living in the world of the 10th grade and self-involved that you will find most politicians. And that's the wrong. One must move out of this self-involved, which has nothing to do with selflessness, and move into what we would recognize as maturity. And the curriculum in the Walnut School helps them. Rarely, except if a child is really rolling on, do we find assertion and argument. What do you think would, well, it's kind of a little bit late. The device we do is really very, very nicely done. It's all is done in the West all the time. We use debate. What's the nature of debate? What's the difference? I'll give you 30 seconds between assertion. Right, great. I'm right. The rest of the world is out there, and I might be interested if it helps me. Argument. I have an opinion. Well, you have an opinion. Too. It's different. I'm going to squash it right now. <laughs> to debate. What's the nature? Be able to hold uh, two different thoughts. Uh, Very nice. Exactly. Two different thoughts, which I must consider legitimate, and I have my own, and I might not even like my thought. I might have been put on this side of the debate and argued with my teacher for hours, and that fool, he still kept me over there. <laughs> yeah, well, that fool knew that you better have be over here, you know, because otherwise you've just been living in your own world, and there's no thought, there's no sort of this, this. Now you've got to handle it. And this going to and fro is absolutely necessary. It's the heart of a democracy. If you ever wonder why democracies disappear so quickly, you can think of it in terms of there's not enough people who went through 11th grade. <laughs> everybody is still, I mean, the most of them, everybody is still a ninth grader or a tenth grader, which is disastrous because everybody's asserting this, that, and the other thing. Just listen to an interview on TV today, and it's not. And are they arguing? But nobody's moving into. Well, you have a point, legitimate point. I have to recognize it. I still want to win this debate, but actually, a debate, a formal debate, is not win or lose. It's who is able to sway and change the audience's opinion. That's the other thing. That's development. That's a curriculum leading through development. What's 12th grade? That really gets good. Yeah. Wow. 12th grade, the pinnacle of all of this education, which, by the way, this picture in here, it's not any longer assertion. In fact, you will find in the 12th grade laughing at themselves as ninth graders. It's always a healthy sign that you can laugh at yourself. They laugh at the parents quite a bit, too. I don't know. I'm not giving away secrets here. They laugh at their parents' fear, and they'd always be ninth graders. Parents do have that fear, by the way. They have 10th grade this, 11th grade this day. What's the key? What do I, as a teacher, look for in 12? What's the other side of speaking that's a development of the day? We just actually use the word active listening. Active listening. Two minutes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So it's, it's come so far. Thank you oh. so much. Like maybe we can pick it up during the question. Okay. And, so, and, and then we end with this listening to another. Thank you. <laughs> and this is child development. And then now uh, I went over time as usual, so I apologize. But we'll be here for questions and answers if you have anything and for the rest of the day. Let's give it up for Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce um, again.
if you have questions ready, we'll, um, we'll have Mr. Gary go until 10.30, and then we'll have 10, to 10 minutes or so for questions before we wrap it up. Um, Gary Lam, he's going to talk about social structure and funding for nonprofits and technology and education. Gary is the director of the Hartwell Valley Center for Social Research and Project Coordinator of the Avalon Initiative and Education Think Tank, both located in upstate New York. He has been involved in World of Education for over 35 years as an economics teacher, administrator, parent, and grandparent. He's the author of four books, two on economics and two on the World of Education. He was a director of private school scholarship fund hope through education for five years and written and lectured on the issues of funding and freedom in education. He's exploring the feasibility of developing a precautionary principle that provides ethical and legal guidelines for the development and use of artificial intelligence and screen technology, including in the field of education. So with that, introduce Gary here. Thank you very much. Yeah, are you clicked up? I think so. Okay, because you can go to 10 30 or so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I, I must say uh, my usual mode of sitting in an audience as the next speaker, I don't listen to anything the speaker said before. Right? And so I, I sort of forgot that characteristic of myself. Again. So I'm wondering what I'm going to say now. <laughs> so um, and also uh, just I'll tell you something personally. I have uh, three grandchildren. Um, I've been living with me for eight weeks this summer They're in, from Guatemala. And so I'm trying not to be the grumpy old grandparent dealing with four teenagers. And when Paul was talking about the 14, 15, and 16 year old, I was uh, nodding yes because yesterday I got six phone calls from the ninth grader. And he's trying to concoct all these kinds of things that I could not imagine. And I'm saying from 3,000 miles away, you can't do that. And uh, it was rough. So I, 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 I um, felt quite strongly uh, connected to what Paul was speaking about. Okay, now um, I'm going to try to capture some of the essence of what Paul described and translate that into considerations of looking at education as on the societal level. Um, and I, I, my background has been in fundraising. I've run a, a scholarship program for five years. Um, I have been a deeply connected to education reform in the United States. I've tracked it for three decades. I've written about it. And what I want to do is share with you um, some of my positive observations and experiences because uh, you and Asha are at a very important stage of development. And you have big questions uh, you're carrying right now. One is the question of volunteerism and administration. How are you going to balance that into the future? Um, and also the question is also um, how, how to develop the right concept or ideas about the appropriate role of government and education. So you're wrestling with those things. So I'm going to share with you some of my observations and experiences in the United States. Um, and I do that in a gesture of goodwill because I think it's important at this crucial stage that you're aware of what's going on in the global world, right? And the United States in a way, in a certain ways, is in the forefront of a lot of activity. Some of them not so good and not so nice. But I think it's important so that when you make these decisions about volunteerism and administration, about um, you know whether to become a you know get involved in advocacy or to focus on you know what you're doing right now. The more you can have an understanding of the bigger picture, I think the better you will be able to make the right decisions going forward. Um, so let's go to the first next slide. Okay. Um, so Paul mentioned briefly uh, these three aspects of society. Um, so I'm going to look at um, these functions of questions. Or something. Okay. Louder? Okay. Um, okay. So 
if you look historically, human evolution, there uh, in the evolution of society and civilization, there are these three aspects that are actually crucial in the development in evolution of society. Um, you have a governing aspect, uh, you have an economic aspect and culture, and I will include education as a primary aspect of modern culture now. That's, it's a driving force, as Paul was describing. And this, the relation of these three have changed over time. And if you look back into uh, you know, Hindu Vedic uh, history, you, and you look at the, uh, the arrangement of society going back to, uh, in relation to culture, you had the Brahmana, this, you know, the spiritual cultural aspect. Uh, government was a more in the Kshatriya aspect, the royalty, uh, the warrior class, and uh, the economy, the commercial class, uh, the Vaishya, uh, excuse my pronunciation. Um, and then you had the Shodra uh, serving all three. And so that is a hierarchical structure. And what I'd like to suggest and for us to think about, hierarchy in these arrangements is no longer appropriate. That each one of these spheres is equally vitally important. And that each one has its own dynamics, should have its own jurisdiction, and they're interdependent at the same time. And also, equally, perhaps the most important, no one of those spheres should dominate the other. And I think we can all agree that there is one sphere globally is dominating the other. And that is economic life. Um, and I'm, again, I'm going to speak from the perspective of the uh, United States. If you look at our recent election, money interests have completely controlled and dominated our government and political process. And um, if we look at this domination, so rather than, I would say, three vital organs of society, we are looking at a situation where one of them are, is dominating. And, is, and historically, you will see different phases where different spheres dominate the other. You will have, um, uh, uh, and also, in, let's say, in trying to wrestle with the right relation, you will find now, in our modern life, different realms that are dominating. So let's say, what would be a manifestation of cultural life dominating the other two spheres? And if you think of some of the war, war zones, it will be kind of fundamentalism, kind of a religious that's trying to dominate and control the state and economic life. And then also historically, you'll find uh, situations where um, the government, the state, is the controlling entity, and the state tries to control economic life. Yeah? And we've seen where that leads to historically. So what I, what I want to suggest is we need to find the right balance. And that understanding and trying to understand that will help one, I believe, to understand the proper, appropriate role of education in the total society. Because you, you can't look at education in isolation. You have to have, what is the effect of education and culture on economic life and government? So what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is follow this a little bit out, the domination of economic life, its influences over government, and both of them on education. And I'm going to use, I would, I'm going to say these are global trends, but I'm going to use specifically uh, what's happening in the United States to um, use as examples. Uh, so, okay. So I have been involved with, as I said, I've tracked education reform in the United States and pretty much globally for three decades. So to understand these trends, because I feel, you know, what happens to education is going to affect all of society and all of the world. So if you are engaged in probably one of the most important tasks that one can be, uh, be, can be engaged in as far as finding the right basis, the right dynamics in, in education. 
Um, so typically what's happened, because of this domination in uh, ec of economic life over the, the spheres, you have to look at the nature of economic life to understand the kinds of influences that economics, the field, the corporate, the work, corporate world, uh, tries to impose upon the other realms. So in our modern market economy, which um, I'll use the word, there is kind of an elite class. The distribution of wealth is growing ever, ever more. And with the implementation, uh, we're at the verge of a technological revolution. We're in the middle of it. It's only going to get worse unless we find a new foundation uh, for the technology industry. And I'll get back to that in a little while. Okay, so economic growth is the most important factor in considering how to support the economy today. Econ economy requires incessant, geometrically increasing economic growth. It has to be. It's grow, merge, or die. This is a kind of innate aspect of our modern form of economic life, our modern form of uh, capitalism. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm trying to be factual and perceptual. I'm not making judgments here, right? Okay, so priority economic growth and competition in the global economy. So in the United States, over the last 30 years, corporate America has very, been very influential in education reform. And they state categorically, the number one priority is economic growth. And so that priority um, is also um, interjected, I would say, into the government process and also um, the creation of learning standards, a national learning standard. Um, so it's a big, I, want, I don't want to go into the whole issue of uh, learning standards. I believe there should be learning standards, but they should not be created by interest groups outside the field of education who have their own agenda. Because everything that Paul was talking about will not be able to unfold if your top priority is economic growth. And then your learning standards are all connected to economic growth and global competition. And what you get, and what we have gotten in the United States, is this linear aspect of education. There is no concept of child development in this approach. You, what you want is to create the capacity to compete in the global marketplace, and you say, oh, these are what the children need, and those are the jobs that they need to and so then you work backward from 12th, 11th to kindergarten. So you start training children in early childhood for you know, 12th grade in college. Meanwhile, we all know most of the jobs aren't even going to be around. But there's this linear thinking of working backwards. Um, so the learning standards. And this is, a, I put it something quote, what is most worth learning and doing in life? So those learning standards embody what is most worth learning and doing in life. Not just learning, but what is most worth learning and doing in life. And that's connected to the economic influence and this growth agenda. So this feeds into the learning standards. Um, and as I mentioned right now, we are coming up to the point of I would say a massive changeover, or let's say an intended massive changeover in the education in the United States, in government education. And that is to change over from what's called the one too many teaching approach. You get what that means? You have one teacher and a lot of students. So that's no longer any good. So, and the idea is that you will personalize education by enabling every child to have a tablet um, with computer programs that I have connected to algorithms to the learning standards, which are connected to economic growth. Okay? So when Paul's talking about this idea of full development, it's pretty much not taken into consideration in this picture. 
Um, so you have these, uh, so this digital education. I, uh, in New York State, uh, I'm from the state of New York, and New York State was in the forefront of trying to implement these national learning standards, or they're not trying, they actually did implement them to a certain degree. So it was the first state to really enforce these uh, learning standards, and in connection to those learning standards, high stakes testing. High stakes testing, you know what that means? The results of those tests uh, have high stakes. High stakes for the children, high stakes for the teachers, and a high stakes for the schools. And those high stakes are connected to economics. And the children know if they don't do well on those tests, their teachers might not return because their teachers are being evaluated by those tests in relation to those learning standards. So there is an incredible pressure on the school, on the teachers and the students themselves. In New York State, we had the largest opt-out movement in the country. You know what that is, opt-out movement? It means the parents, about 250,000 families, refuse to allow their children to take the state tests connected to the learning standards because they experience firsthand in the home and in the observation of the children the results of this, I would say, standardization of this exam. And the children basically, you know, they have experience like the children no longer want to go to school. They, they you know, they cry, they don't want to go. Um, and also the parents observe the tests in relation to the standards have no correlation to child development. The, the, what they're trying to introduce takes no consideration to what Paul was talking about, the needs of the child. So it's an abstract um, approach to learning standards connected to the needs of economic growth. Okay, and then, of course, another aspect of our modern education is competition, profit. And this is a part of, uh, let's say, so this becomes a competition based funding system and competition competing for jobs. Um, so the idea is to introduce merit pay for teachers, right? So the better their students perform on the tests, the more pay they're going to have. Right? And also the composite scores of the schools, the better the scores are on those tests connected to learning standards, connected to economic growth, the more money the schools are going to get. So there is this, uh, well, the economy likes to use money to get its way and influence things, but you can see how it seeps down into this pressure. Okay, next slide. Okay, now I want to, I want to just forget about all that. And I want to try to connect to, uh, you know, a lot of things that Paul was saying. So instead of a monolithic um, kind of standardized curriculum, and so, before we get into this, I want to mention three effects of this uh, education reform approach with economics dominating the learning standards. One is a narrowing of the curriculum because you want to be able, uh, you want to accomplish what is demanded in relation to economic growth. So you eliminate the humanities. You, you eliminate creative play for children in kindergarten because they don't have time for that. They've got to prepare for this job in the global marketplace. Um, so that's one, narrowing curriculum, standardization. And the other one, and this is something I think you really have to think about, is that through this national curriculum, you're perpetuating an ideology. You're perpetuating a view of economic life. You're saying to the children, this form of economic life that we have now is the best now and for you into the future. All right, you get that? Yeah. Okay, so now let's look at, so I want to give an alternative picture and look at what kind of funding system would support a more holistic, uh, I would say balanced view of education and also to bring a balance between those three realms where no one of them is dominating the other. So it's a question of pedagogy, 
and education, but also societal arrangements. That's what you're really working on. You know, you're not just helping uh, disadvantaged children. You're looking, you're actually, what you're working on is revolutionary as far as finding the right relation to education, including to government and economic forces. Yeah. So it's really important for you to understand that. Understand this is a kind of trend that I'm describing where the United States is in leadership. This is what's happening in the world. And you can be sure India is going, if it, it's already experiencing that domination of money, interest group, economics, um, and also the technology exclusion. You have to assume that five to 10 years, education is going to be truly transformed if, let's say, the economic interest can influence the government, which can influence the schools. So this, these are forces that are out there. Okay, so rather than seeing, remember that other slide where education is at the bottom, above it is government, and above that is economic life? What if we work from the conception that education is a vital, independent uh, activity in, in its own right? It's justified as a vital activity in its own right, and meaning that it should not be controlled by interest, the outside interest groups, and that in the field of education is where the learning standards should come from. And just think about those people yesterday, it was so inspiring to hear the ones in person, but also the ones on the teleconference, about their experiences working with children. That was, that was not just head, that was hard forces. And for me, those are the kinds of people I would like to see uh, making decisions like learning standards in the direction of education. They are in it. They have those experiences. So those are the kinds of people who uh, should be at the head or taking the lead as far as administration decisions. Not CEOs, not politicians, educators, the best of leaders. Okay, vital activity unto itself, and the activity is not to focus narrowly on what economic growth needs, but you want to develop the full, the child's full development. And I, I this is my personal opinion, I don't think anything will overcome in, uh, inequity, overcome disadvantage in society than enabling every child to develop their full capacities. That is an equalizer. That's, if you start there, then you have the basis for equality in all the other realms. If you don't have that, then you're always going to have the underprivileged and the disadvantaged. So this is the key element, full development, self-education. That means education is not filling the child with information. Education is creating the opportunity in the situations and the conditions for them to educate themselves through the sensing of the teachers. So it's a creative dynamic, the education part, which the teachers are vitally involved in, essentially important, which technology-approach-based education will eliminate. The idea is actually get rid of teachers, get rid of classrooms. Yeah. Okay, self-education. Ability to understand, critique, and transform. To me, this is probably the most important thing that you can encourage, is that in education, you, you enable the children to understand the societal arrangements, to critique them, and also give them the capacity to change the structure of our economic life, change the structure of our and foundation of our government and policy. Otherwise, what you're doing is um, the other arrangement is perpetuating the existing economic form, forms and elitism. You want them to give them the opportunity to understand, critique, and transform. That to me is the total or it's the main goal of education, so that the, each generation can create their own conditions, their own society based on what their ethics and morals are not what a previous generation has done, or in you know, certain arrangements. Okay, teacher developed learning standards, 
I already mentioned that, sensing the future. To, I would say everything about old style, I would say everything about technology-based education is based on the past. It's based on data of what had transpired in the past. Educument, and when Paul's describing this, the teacher is sensing where the child is in that stage of development. And what are their needs? What, are the, what, are the, what do they want to develop? And also through that, you get a sense of where the future is going so, um, through those children. So it's really a main capacity that teachers need to develop is to sense the future through what is rising through the children as individuals, but as a generation. Very important for the development of society. Okay, next slide. Okay, okay, so using that, what are, what are the key aspects of funding? So I would ask you to consider that in the future of what you're striving for with ASHA. What is it that is an ideal characteristics of funding mechanism? And let's disregard whether it's private sector funding or government. I'm just trying to describe something that, okay, these are the key aspects for funding. Adequate funding. It means every child should have sufficient resources to be able to be educated. That is the meaning of the right of a child to education. A right is an opportunity. It's not an obligation. A right is an opportunity. And every child deserves that equal opportunity. And without the resources, it's not going to happen. So that is one thing that government should be involved in, to ensuring those resources are available, sufficient resources for all children, and that the children who are um, have a right to it get those funds. Um, adequate funding for children, but also teachers. You need. I mean, this gets down to treating teachers as professionals. You want, you know, teaching, educating really should be elevated to the highest profession that we have in all the sectors. The future of our humanities depends on that. And they should have appropriate support, financial support, so they're not having to do three jobs in order to uh, do this, right? Okay, elevate, encourage teacher training, emphasizes the whole child development. This is something you could think about at adding, you know, you do support some teacher training. You can actually think about supporting whole child development and not just focus on job creation or preparing for jobs, but the whole capacity. That's what's going to uh, overcome disadvantages in children. School administration. If the government's not administering schools, then who's going to administer? It actually has to be an administration that arises out of the field of education itself. Administration is, a, and think of the word, administer, to minister. What does it mean to minister something? It means to serve. Administration should be serving the education process. It should be serving the educators, not serving the needs of CEOs and corporations and politicians. The focus is on the children in education. Parent education, I think this is vital. I think in the future, parenting, the natural skill of parenting within the, the technology age, particularly computers, is going to be lost, diminished. Our natural ability to parent. And so it's something that we have to actually work on. I think understanding of child development is going to be crucial. So that when you make the right decisions for your child in the home, and also hopefully have the advantage of choosing appropriate education for your child. So this parent education is an important part. Um, teacher learning, led learning standards. I mentioned uh, that already. I feel actually learning standards are very important, but it shouldn't come out of the economic realm or the political realm. It actually should arise out of the people who are most knowledgeable, most experienced, and directly involved in ed. Uh, children. Love. That's what it's all about. You want to identify and promote teachers that love children and the profession of teaching. And I can say, you know, all the people from ASHA who are in, now in the field of education, that's their characteristic. Those people, those people connected to ASHA who have gone to the teaching, they love children. They, as one of them 
and said, I no longer want to be a researcher. My profession, my calling is teaching. And though that's what you want to try to support, people who feel education and teaching is their vocation. That's what they want to do in life. Um, uh, and last thing, common sense, physical, uh, fiscal and legal accountability standards. Um, yeah, you want to model a corruption-free education system, right? Um, so, it, you know, I, you know, in the United States, I'm involved in political lobby groups, education tax credits, and things like that, which I'll mention. And it's important to have common sense accountability standards as far as the fiscal um, health and well-being of the school that you require certain accountability uh, or accounting re uh, reporting, and also the you want to ensure that the schools are abiding by the appropriate laws about safety and security of children, protection against fraud, things like that. So that to me is an important part of thinking about the bigger picture of education, and those are, those kinds of activities to develop that should be funded also. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so down to the last two. So here's, I, what I do here is to show the flow of money in different ways in the United States that education is funded. So it's just something for you to think about. Uh, things might be different in India, but you might consider these options in your future as possibilities. So there's basically A and B. A, the money, uh, the government collects the money through taxation. It uh, redistributes to its own schools and also uh, non-government schools. Uh, that's the way it is in the United States. So you have the direct funding of government schools and indirect funding of non-government schools using vouchers or education savings accounts. So instead of the money going directly to the schools, with the vouchers, the money goes through the, to the parents the schools, right? So you're enabling with this some choice with the with the parents. Now there's an, uh, another part. Well, first of the B1 is basically what you're in, engaged in. You're following the V track. Um, okay, parents pay the tuition, certain amount of tuition, and donations to schools and scholarship funds. So this is completely separate from government. Um, there is no incentive or it's not connection, it's not really connected to ensuring the right of education to every child. You're doing this out of a kind of a cultural impulse. Now, there is a bridge to government, the right of a child enforced by the government with B2. This is something I think you should consider. How do you incentivize uh, individuals and businesses to support education without the money going through the government? And the United States, the Supreme Court said that the money going through tax credits for tuition payments, which is good for middle income families, but not good for low or no income families, because they don't pay taxes. So the other route for that is uh, tax credits uh, to, uh, for donations to scholarship funds. You're doing scholarship funds. In the United States, there's about 25 donation tax credit programs in various states. So that means um, the tax credit means your taxes are reduced by the amount of the credit. Um, and I'll give you an example. They all started out in Arizona. Individuals, and just individuals, were allowed a $500 tax credit if they gave the money donated to a scholarship fund. That means their taxes were reduced by $500. So, they're, uh, so basically what they're doing is to um, individualizing the support of education. They're connected to enabling the right of a child in education because it's under the, the government system. Um, and with those $500, it doesn't sound like much, but I went to, uh, I visited a scholarship fund in Arizona and they were giving away $7 million a year. And it was all based on $500 uh, donations. So you can figure out how many people involved. Um, you see, what you're doing is incentivizing people uh, in this situation to actually contribute um, and directing, making a decision on an individual basis of supporting education without going through the uh, process. Um, and then you can get into corporate tax credits. Uh, I'm on a lobby group in New York State. 
um, where we're trying to actually have a combination of tuition tax credits and donation tax credits. Middle class gets the tuition tax credits. The lower, you know, poor people have access to scholarships from organizations that receive donations from businesses and people uh, that get tax credits. You can, if it sounds complicated, it's not so, but you can ask me later. But it's a different way of thinking about it. Um, and it's, you know, another option I think you could think about in India and with Asha. Okay, next slide. Okay, now, in conclusion, given that we're at Microsoft, um, and the um, issue of technology education is going to be a major issue that you're going to have to contend with, no matter which way you go, um, administratively or voluntarily or advocacy for government. This is a major issue, and I, and I urge you, I plead, that you understand this, um, uh, what's involved in uh, using technology in education. I'll just make one comment before I uh, actually outline what I think is a, a, a healthy way to create a basis for technology for educators and technology designers to work together. Um, maybe I'll just I'll, I'll just jump to that. Okay, but, you know, based on everything I said, that if education is a field under itself, recognized in its own right, and that educators are actually developing the learning standards. So when it comes to the use of technology, it is actually the educators and teachers who should have the ultimate say to what degree, when, and how much technology is used in education. And not, excuse me, tech designers. Yeah? This actually has to come out of people engaged in that process. Um, and I apologize if I'm offending somebody with that. And in that whole uh, sense, you know, the question is, and the educators have to be free from political and commercial interests that perpetuate the existing elite system that we're in. Um, full child development. Um, so whatever is being developed between educators and designers is not focused on just job security or the economic growth. It's really focused on the development of whole child. Um, input from parents, healthcare practitioners, and researchers. This is what really astounds me and worries the most about the uh, trend in technology education. There seems to be no regard whatsoever to research studies on the effect of screen technology on children in the early ages, on brain development. Um, and there seems to be no ethical or legal framework in which, in which to control this. So I think this is a very important part that you get uh, input from healthcare practitioners and researchers um, in the development of you know, what's the appropriate use of technology in education. And also parents, what's the effect of using technology all day in school? What is the effect in the home? Um, selfless love and sacred duty. The basis of education has to be on love. I would say education and teaching, it needs to be a love, the equivalent of a love for a parent for their children. That's a natural connection. So this is a conscious connection, right? Out of the love, I intend to be an educator. And that is the, I would say, really the foundation of education. And that's the kind of thing, I think, as a funding organization, the, you know, schools and conditions that work from this question of working out of our basis, of working out of love, is a very important aspect. And it is a sacred. What you're doing is a sacred, high holy task of enabling disadvantaged children to have an appropriate education. And then, now this will probably be the most not uh, uh, difficult to swallow for anybody who's into the market economy and capitalism. Um, if you want to have the education based on love, and let's say beyond one's, now not only outside interests, but your own personal ego is that you, you, the children have to be uppermost. You have to put aside the lower ego and operate out of your higher ego to see their attention. Um, and so 
in order to do that, we can't, this collaboration cannot be on a for profit basis. If you put this collaboration of technology and education together on a for profit basis, you're introducing things outside the principal blog and outside the field of education. You're opening it up to economic interests and political interests by doing so. So, um, and if you want, I, I, uh, I'll just, the next slide, but not yet. So anyway, so this is, a, to me, an important point. So that's basically the, what I have to say. And just go to the last one, I just want to acknowledge a few people. Okay, if you're, if these thoughts intrigue you or disturb you or disrupt your own, and you want to wrestle there a little bit, uh, these are three people. Uh, you already heard about Riddle Steiner. Otto Scharmer is the senior lecturer at the Massachusetts of Technology. He is, um, five minutes? Yeah, got it. Actually, I only had three. <laughs> um, and he's the one, he develops not only in education, he's actually has been named the number one educator in the world, right? And he talks about presencing the future. Teaching out of the sensing the future. So if that intrigues you, that's something to look at. And Douglas Rushkoff is, um, uh, have any of you read uh, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus? Anybody read that? And it's looking at what is the proper social foundation for technology development. And he feels like either technology industry will wreak havoc and lead us to basically uh, the brink of um, disaster, if not beyond, or the technology ag industry, if it evaluates itself, can actually be a leading force to find a new legal uh, structures on which to found economic life. Um, so he makes the case in this book that um, that technology is not only a threat, it's actually an opportunity to transform all of social life and to bring into harmony those three spheres of economics, politics, and culture. Um, so in conclusion, um, yes, I ask you just to take what I've said as not trying to, uh, would you say, influence you unduly, uh, but I did try to show you certain thoughts and ideas um, that I have perceived and carried through, I would say, decades of thinking about education reform in the United States. And if you're not facing these kinds of considerations now, you will in the next few years. So if you're thinking for Asha about moving into the future, I, I feel obligated to share these thoughts with you. And I share them as for you to consider and May God bless us all. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think we have questions. Sure. Um, we can do uh, four or five questions um, yeah. for both of you. Can we sit? I think he did. You, you, I, do you want I to? mentioned. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I mean, do you want? But again, I asked to mention again that these. Yeah. Can, they're outside. They're outside. And, we have stuff that one of children have made also on the table that is woodworking. Yeah, and displays of work else. from some students okay. in this okay. area. That you okay. cannot take, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Display, that. yeah. <laughs> Great. So there's a question for Mr. Gary. So is there any state in the U.S. that approaches this um, attitude to education that you're suggesting? Um, there are states in the United States states which are implementing education tax, a lot of them actually, and with the attitude, um, it comes to organizations, uh, so it actually is not a correct question. You shouldn't be asking if the state has this attitude, you should be asking is there an educational impulse that is carrying this attitude that is trying to transform the thinking in economic and political life, okay? so. Um, so I would say starting out with that question is leading down the wrong, wrong road. Um, if you capture the meaning, I think that question belongs for educators. And yes, there are, uh, 
independent education groups uh, and uh, Walmart Education Association who are carrying that in hopes to respond. Okay, great. Uh, this is for Mr. Paul. So from your experience in the U.S., how effective has your lobbying organization been in influencing policy reform with respect to education, and does it make a difference? I'm not part of a lobbying force at all. I've just been a teacher for 40 years and have seen in different countries and in different states uh, this development, this child development as it works out. Uniformly, one could say, and over time, the changes. Thank you. Oh, that's right. I don't have my here. Uh, the changes that uh, have occurred since, let's say, I first was in the classroom forty years ago. The children have changed quite a bit. So, in my own research institute, and I've talked with a lot of teachers in this regard, but I'm not a part of the lobbying group. Okay, got it. Um, this is for Gary. Do you really believe giving every child a tablet would improve child's learning ability, learning early in their life? What's the data? Uh, have you, do you have a data around this? Do I believe that? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the data? Um, there's actually quite a bit of data tracking the use of technology in education. And uh, virtually all the data, virtually all the data, um, shows that there is no significant uh, improvement uh, with the technology implementation thus far. So there is no empirical data that says, yeah, this is the way to go. It is not there. Mm, okay. This is for Paul. Children development influenced by social structure. Individual society creates individual children not well connected. Whereas highly structured society Create, uh, creates well connected children. What do you think? Uh, I don't understand the question. <laughs> so, do you want? Yeah. I, I, I think there are, there are different societies. Uh, there are societies, I mean, different growing up in the US, uh, that is different from other societies. So, are we right? Are we right? Are we right? questions. Yeah, I, I, I think that means uh, uh, if children are loved by the society, by the family, uh, they grow up better. And people are, who are not loved or rejected, uh, they are uh, become individuals. Human beings, uh, they are not connected. Mm -hmm. So I've seen uh, children growing up in different societies uh, having different uh, influence. So what do you think? I mean, is this. Is this is this what I mean? We, we want to see. I mean, we want to see an well connected society where I mean, students are learning. Um, well, I think what we want to see are individuals that recognize that they're actually in the society that they're in, and that they know that they're on boundaries both with themselves and the society, and recognizing what these limits are, then they try to live effectively in that society. And in America, actually that means that this great attraction we have for individualism, individuality, individuation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which we value so highly, has to be damped down. I mean, we have 350 million individuals who are simply these days evolving into a position where there are 350 different societies. This, there's no future in that. In China, on the other hand, you have I, my experience with, with children in China, the very first time I grew up taught in grade nine, and one of the elements was for them to create their own society, an image of it, and then, and, and then uh, we make uh, uh, models of it and present it. And I said, what do you as an individual want from your state. And I knew all these things about China, and I literally needed my homemade lesson, which is two hours, to just discuss that notion of an individual. So obviously, in China, and what Walter education can bring there, and what China needs, and they know this, that's why it's there, is that this notion of the individual has to almost free itself 
from this overbearing relationship to society, and especially in many ways, the family. And of course, one says this and said, well, you know, that's a terrible thing to say. Um, not so, because we do not deny a family when we say, I am not only my family. So I think all of education is suited around the world as long as it seeks this balance, as long as it recognizes that two incredibly important forces, an individual who must exist, and a society who is not just a platform for my existence, but actually has a living reality for others, that must continue to exist too. Great. Thank you. Um, this is from Mr. Gary. A proposal is to have individuals and business directly donate to school. Do you think corporations donating to schools will have unique influence? Example, Microsoft funding, focusing on tech and ignoring arts and social issues. Yeah, a very good question. Um, it's obvious, obviously. Um, so, um, the way you can actually set up the tax credit program so that it actually screens out um, that kind of influence. For instance, in the state of Florida, uh, they have a tax credit program. I think they do two or three hundred million dollars in um, scholarships through the program, and uh, it's a statewide program. The uh, corporations, I think, it's just a corporate tax credit. They can, the only thing they can do is. Um, donate to the scholarship fund, and the scholarship fund uh, controls who the children go, and the, the, the corporations have no influence on past. Uh, the only influence they have is actually um, they get a tax credit for it, so they do not uh, have control. You, so you can set up programs so that you do, but if you're concerned about that, you can actually uh, set up the tax credit so that they do not, it screens out their influence. And most of them, I don't know actually any where a corporate corporation has any direct influence on the education process uh, in about 20 states so far. Okay. Uh, this is to Mr. Paul. Is the philosophy behind Waldorf system to let students go through different phases naturally, like separated, aggressive, etc.? Is that is that is the philosophy behind Waldorf system to let it go through naturally, all of these spaces? Uh, Waldorf offers very many different kinds of discipline, including you don't do that, but <laughs> tends to favor those that sees the students at certain stages and then guides them through it, both providing support for them to see their way through it and being patient enough, especially uh, in high school, to let them themselves um, uh, experience the limitations of it. So we do a variety of these different disciplines, but we're very keen on the students internalizing what it is that they're doing so that they recognize it as their own activity. And then we can say that when they move beyond it, they really have moved beyond it. And that was the foundation for their work. Um, a Walter teacher has a lot of patience, but not unlimited patience. <laughs> and the, the discipline usually starts off with, especially in grade school, when there's been an argument or this, that, and the other thing, is to take two students, three, however uh, many, and ask them to write down what it is that just happened. And that itself is a sobering experience when you get four different reports from three different students who were in an argument. And then the minute you bring this forward, then that's the beginning of the healing of that situation. And we try to always make sure that the students not just get the point, but they feel it and then assume that they will work on it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what would, this is not specific to who, but I guess both, either of you could answer. What would be a method for you to recognize a good teacher? If standardized testing is not an answer, what's what's to be sure a child is developing? Is it completely a teacher-led, or um, is it a hybrid? What do you what do you think it should look like? And will the slides be shared? I guess that's for Gary. Uh, yes, I, I, the slides. I can give those out so that 
Yeah, I think that a teacher is someone who establishes a relationship with the class and does it from the point of view of not just what let's just call the students and all he male and the teacher is female, not just what she wants to bring, that she recognizes that every day is different with this group that she responds to the needs of the group, that actually she will spend a lot of time in the evening preparing a lesson, that the next day, as she reviews what she had done the day before, realizes that the students didn't have a clue as to what she was trying to do. So she immediately will redo her lesson and combine it with this one. This sort of attention to the, to the student not just as an audience for me, not just as a container for these things that I know, but actually as my reason for being there. But there's an element of the selflessness that I was talking about. And by modeling that, one will over time, because one of the models of knowledge education is that a teacher from grade one will stay with the grade school as long as she can, often up to grade eight. So this group knows each other. And that to teach from the point of view of who's receiving it is the characteristic of a good teacher. It's not something they necessarily bring in with them, but if they can learn it, then that's all the better. Because if you're learning things, the students will also learn. I can I just add to something. Steiner was talking about teacher training, and he said the number one uh, evaluation tool or evaluation metric is the ability of the teacher to sense what lies in the inner being of the child. And then that takes precedent over your uh, informational knowledge. So it's this sensing and connection to the child is uh, probably one of the most important, if not the important. Main important to evaluate, and he actually says whether a teacher passes or fails their teacher training exam. So it's a qualitative uh, metric. It's not informational. It's not data. It's a quality that the teacher carries. And uh, yeah, and I think that's quality you have heard about and heard people speak about uh, yesterday with people. So that it's a qualitative metric. Could I just add to that and refine it a little bit? We find that this statement that teachers stay with their class one through eight, this is a thought that's been around for nearly 100 years. Find in the last three decades or so that many teachers are very good in the early grades. And then when they get into six, seven, eight, when there is a lot more content, because there is a lot of content, they're less comfortable. So the pattern can change. So a good teacher can be somebody who can take and shape the class, form the class so that it's receptive to everything in the class and teaching, and they get a grade six and just flame out. So the school steps in and says, would you do one through five? She's very grateful to do only one through five. Meanwhile, somebody else comes in six, seven, eight, that loves this academic content and loves the meeting of children in that way. And then you have high school teachers who indeed are specialized, who like adolescents. And these people exist, they do. You just like adolescents. You like this give and take. You like the fact that there's something so uh, exciting about what they're bringing into it, even though it's impertinent, ridiculous, all these different things, <laughs> but they're all nothing. Great. I think with that, we probably conclude the session. Um, there's one question, and uh, they try, they're they trying to test my reading abilities, and I'm not falling for that. <laughs> so you know which question hasn't been asked, so please reach out to the speakers directly during the break, because it's like six lines of, so it's really testing my reading abilities. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna request that individual to actually ask the question to the panelists later during the break. Thank you again for uh, for your for sharing your uh, knowledge. You. And then inspiring us. I'm going to request to 
neighbors to come over and uh, give us all a memento to the moment that we are on the floor. Thank you so much. Thanks again. And um, we're going to take a break, and then there's going to be a panel amongst uh, different organizations. And uh, we'll be back at 11. One more reminder during the break, please do go and quickly write what times you're leaving. And if you can drop them to the leaving from here. Leaving from here, yes. And then uh, if you can drop folks during that time, if you have a car. And, and dropping folks is the airport, right? Yes. Yeah.
participation from the nonprofits that pretty much similar to ASHA in terms of the structure and also the type of work that they do within India. And uh, the goal for the panel is try to see what we can learn from them in terms of the work that they have been doing and also how we can collaborate and partner better together to serve the, uh, serve the goals, uh, goals in India. So I'll start with uh, each, one of the, each one of the representation. From Aid, we have Ravi Kuchim Kuchimanti. I hope I say your name correctly. Kuchimanti. Kuchimanti. Kuchimanti, okay. While a graduate student at the University of Maryland, Ravi founded the Aid in 1991. With the vision, problems are interconnected, so must be the solution. AID has matured into a volunteer moment for sustainable holistic development with 30 chapters in USA and AID Australia, UK, AID India, and he plays a very active role in AID's continuous development. Ravi has a BTEC in civil engineering from IIT Mumbai and PhD in physics from the University of Maryland. So you please come and speak. Vikram Kalana, aim for SEVA. Vikram is a technology entrepreneur and leader in the Seattle area. Since 2003, he has been growing and leading Wind Shuttle, an enterprise data management company, as the founder and CEO. Before, he was in leadership roles in various companies in the Seattle area, including TIPCO and Verica. He is an electrical engineer by training and has a PhD from the University of Washington, Seattle, and a BTEC from IIT, Canada. Vikram is passionate about the cause of education of the underprivileged community and has been a supporter of Asha and Cry for over 20 years. Since 2015, he's been involved in founding Seattle chapter of AIM for SEVA, an nonprofit focused on transforming rural education through the concept of free student homes of Chattalayas <laughs> in India. Vinu Sri Vitsan has been a volunteer with Viva for eight years. She's currently Director of Programs for Viva. Vinu has led the Viva's flagship marathon training program in the Bay Area, the Dream Team M. And before that, she led Viva's National Grants Team. In both these roles, she's collaborated with Asha, Pratham, and other nonprofits. Vinu is a product, product manager, poet, um, and global nomad. She's also an advisory board for Pratham Bay Area. From Cry. Dinesh Mehta works at Microsoft as a program manager and has been volunteering for Cry since 2009. He has um, worked actively with Cry and Seattle volunteers to raise funds for projects in India, which has impacted his life in multiple ways. He believes that when the volunteers hear the brave stories of the project from the social workers and employees, it pushes them to do as much as they can, as we all know. Welcome. Um, Pradeep Jayaman, Master of All Education. And Pradeep Jayama has been a volunteer for Asha since 2007 in various capacities at Stanford Chapter and Asha White. He was the Asha White Projects Coordinator from 2012 to 2014 and the Asha White Coordinator between 2014 and 16. He has the MS in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University and works in the computer industry. Welcome. <laughs> Our own Sneha um, Karamia. Asha for Education, and she's going to be the moderator for the panel. Snehu has been an Asha volunteer since 2008 and taken on various roles in the Stanford chapter, including treasurer, chapter coordinator, holy coordinator, as well as two words of few projects. She graduated from Stanford University with MS in Environmental Engineering and continues to work in the field, and she's going to lead the panel. And as usual, um, write your questions. And then we'll, we'll do the collection at the end. The challenger is going to moderate. If we have time for the questions, then we'll be able to moderate or as usual, we'll get to the answer later. Thanks. Take it away, Snegu. Hello. 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 Okay, first of all, I would like to thank all of the organizations on behalf of ASHA for accepting our invitation for this collaboration. It's been on my mind for several years and finally it's at least happening. Uh, the idea was that we've all been here in the US for at least 
uh, two, uh, one decade or more. Uh, but we don't talk to each other in spite of having the maximum amount of communication devices and everything. And the project partners in India have to uh, contact each one of us separately. So what can we do to make their lives better and have a better impact on the ground? That's the point of the moderation. So first I would like uh, all the um, organizations to take five minutes, tell us about when you started, how you functioned, your challenges and um, successful aspects. We'll stick to five minutes because we want um, enough time for discussion. Hi, I'm from uh, the Association for India's Development. Uh, so, uh, aid supports uh, projects in different areas like education, health, human rights, social justice, women's empowerment, farmers issues, agriculture and so on. Uh, so, uh, I think from what I understood about the panel, we also want to see the differences uh, between the organizations and how we function with our chapter model and how different groups function with theirs from talking to the organizers yesterday. So, one of the things that aid does uh, when we started aid, one of the important questions was that if aid is reflecting the NRI voice, then that's a very mainstream voice. Would it really reflect the voice of the people whom we want to help, which are the tribals, the farmers, the fish workers, and so on? They have a voice too. How does their voice get represented in aid? Because the mainstream NRI voice could be completely opposite. <laughs> Uh, to what uh, to what the farmers and the drivers and the fish workers whom we and the Dalits uh, are seeing as the issue and you know so 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 how is that their voice getting represented in aid right so therefore aid uh, kind of realized when it started that a completely democratic structure in the NRI base has a danger of just reflecting what we think should is needed for India's development and not understanding uh, what uh, what is needed really at the grassroots. And when I say this, I mean, for example, in complex issues, such as, for example, building dams, where we would have learned uh, that da dams are the symbol of modern temples of modern India and so on. How do you deal with the fact that the leading human rights activist like Mira Parker is protesting on the streets, while most of the people, our friends and family, would believe that she is doing something wrong? And uh, she is really representing uh, the, both the environment and the displacement cause. And not only that, he is claiming to represent through the Namda Bachava Andolan the true faith of development. Matam, one of the slogans is, Vika Hame Vikas Chahiye Vinash Nahi. So they are essentially calling the dam as destruction and what they want is Vikas. So how does aid understand that? So for that, and in the part of the structure of aid, just like Asha has chapters, aid has chapters. But in addition, we thought that aid needs to have a board uh, that is aligned with the voice of the people uh, who are more experienced in form. So the slight difference, I think, between Asha and aid is that we have decentralized chapters, but at the same time, we also have parallel to them a, a board of directors and an executive board, which is, uh, which is independent of the chapters. And that board uh, is chosen from volunteers who have the sensitivity uh, to understand the grassroots uh, issues in India. And that has helped aid uh, and aid chapters uh, understand uh, activism in India. So one of the things that aid does, uh, aid slogan is Sangar Seva Nirman, which we picked up from NBA and other groups. So one of the things uh, is that it's not only Nirman or constructive activity like supporting schools or health, but also we have to protest Sangarsh against the injustice. Uh, and when you think about who protests the most, you will find that the first person who protests is the villager. That is supposing an Anganwadi center in a village is not working, or a school in a village is not working, or a health center in a village is not working, the person who raises the voice the first is the person who is affected by that, right? Who doesn't get the benefits. They will start protesting. So adding our voice, so they are its strength there, right? And when you think about here from here supporting something, it's our strength and our dollars and our voice. But when we think about actually adding something to their voice, we are adding something to protest where they are the center. So we recognize village people as not affected people, but as uh, or victims, but as survivors and those who are at the center of change. And uh, and one of the other things that aid may have done well in initial years that helped aid kind of understand the Sangharsh aspects of Indian struggles and get us its closely linked, uh, you know, with various struggles uh, in India, both on 
uh, you know, both for pluralism against religious fundamentalism, uh, on uh, uh, you know, on uh, on development versus uh, destruction issues like mega projects like dams and so on, environmental causes, social justice issues, while at the same time picking health, agriculture, farmers. Uh, so one of the uh, you know th uh, things that have been our Divan Sati program. So some of the volunteers of aid, uh, just like Sandeep has gone back, uh, you know, after uh, aid uh, started growing here, some of us did go back to India, about eight or nine of us over the years. Uh, and aid uh, started kind of a fellowship or a consultancy program with them uh, to enable support. And that has also, and they, uh, and whatever they have found by working at the grassroots has been a part of AIDS knowledge, learning, uh, and the direction, you know, like that, them supported by the board uh, has helped chapters, given time for chapters to understand it. So today, I think I would say aid uh, is at the forefront of, like, it's at the cutting edge of what goes on with the most grassroots of groups in India. So whether it is an anti-corruption campaign or today like a raging crisis or farmers issues are something that you hear a lot in the news, farmers suicide is still. So we have like one of our Divan Sati Kiran Visa, he's gone back, uh, you know, like about four or five years ago and he's working with grassroots farmers groups and has linked us up uh, with some of the best groups in India and we understand uh, therefore changing these issues, not only organic farming and sustainable agriculture is important, but changing the policy and questioning the Indian government's policies, uh, you know, the Sangharsh part of it. And reading the policy change is also important. So it, it enables support to both and our volunteers also watch their footprints. Uh, so the Seva part of it uh, is uh, like yourself, uh, you know, like uh, watching your own footprint, ecological footprint, uh, and trying to become a better person uh, in terms of what you do in life. So the, that, uh, that, that, that three things, Sangash, Seva and Iman, together with the fact that we believe problems are interconnected, so solutions must be, which basically means that we, like, I'm just not just education, right? Like, we have put on the focus of everything. Uh, and the village and the person at the lowest end is our focus. Uh, you know, and the channel to reach that lowest end. Uh, I say lowest only in that sense, that's the last mile. Uh, but the basic idea of aid is that they, their voice is what should be reflected in aid. And, and, our, uh, and over the years, I think after about 2007 or so, our volunteers have understood the Sankarsh aspect of aid and are very comfortable with, the, with like I said, the voices of the Nandolan or the voices of the and like Arvind Kejriwal's or before he became a politician or Arunar Rai, so I Sandeep giving his peace yatra uh, and, and things like that. Right? So, so those are the voices that it understood and it's, it, uh, it put its solidarity behind. Uh, and that is very different from the mainstream NRI voice through which it draws its volunteers. And, and that is the step of that aid uh, gives an opportunity for those like to, for that mainstream NRI voice to understand and change. Uh, and align itself with the voice of the grassroots. That's the biggest role I think aid plays in this. Uh, Thank you, Ramji. I would also like to add that aid was founded in 1991. Yeah. Same as that of Yeah, yeah. yeah. founded in the opposite cause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, great. So I'm, I'm representing AIM for Seva. AIM is All India Movement for Seva. And uh, the, uh, the organization started in the year 2000, so we're about 17 years old. Uh, I've been myself involved with it for the last couple of years. Um, the, the big thing about AIM for SEVA is focus. So, so it's very focused on a very specific cause, uh, and that cause is rural education uh, in India. And, uh, and it's specifically about childhood development uh, as it pertains to, to education. So, so the concept is really simple. The concept is uh, a free student house or a hostel, free student hostel. So we build hostels near existing schools. So the government is spending a lot of money on education to private these private schools. So we're not we're not solving the school problem because what we're doing is a lot of organizations solving the education problem itself, but we're solving the the getting to school problem, which is which affects rural children a lot. A lot of kids drop out uh, <coughs> between, say, fourth and sixth grade because the next level school is is 
10 miles from, from their village and, and they cannot go there. So, so the, the, the idea of, of, uh, of a hostel near an existing school and then recruiting children to live in that hostel, uh, that is the simple concept that's, uh, that, that uh, it was started out in, in the year 2000. So now there's about 100 hostels operating in, uh, in over 20 states in India. And uh, um, so it's a very scalable model, right? So the, the concept is very simple to, to explain, to develop. Uh, you need three employees to run a hostel with 100 kids. Uh, and so, so the model is, is simple and scalable and, and, and it's, 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 it's very impactful. So, so we've seen this for the last uh, 17 years. We've graduated a lot of children um, uh, through this program. Um, and now those children come back and, and help out um, the, the kids that are, who are in the hostels. And, and, uh, and, and all these hostels are, are in rural areas. So that, that's another important thing. So it's not near a city or, or in a city. It'll be in some, um, some remote uh, part usually. And, uh, and, um, and that, that's, that's really it. And it doesn't, the, the cost model is very well defined. Uh, uh, the operation model is very well defined. There's coordinators in India who, who, who have, so, so if you need three employees to run a hostel, there is, uh, there's one coordinator who can manage about four or five hostels, uh, and, and that's kind of how, how this, the scale model operates. Um, and the U.S. chapters are essentially fundraising chapters. So we, uh, we have about 20 chapters in different cities, and we're fundraising for the operational um, costs for these, uh, for these hostels. That's what I'm for sure. Thank you, Richard. All right, so I was planning to go and talk about Drive, but after hearing the stories, I'm going to take a slightly different path. Uh, I'm going to talk about two, three small, quick stories. Um, the first one is, think about 20 years back, there's a couple who wants to do something for the society, but they don't have resources. Um, um, especially when you're a woman, it's hard to uh, you know, go into the um, social segment without having the support of your family, your, your, your husband, and everybody else. Um, so, so keep that thought. Um, second is a 17-year-old person who, in 1991, would decide to adopt two girl childs at 17 year old age uh, with no money, with no job options and anything, going against the family and going against the standards. Um, the third story is actually related to what, what um, Vikram just said, which is um, there are buildings everywhere, there are schools, um, and, and there are a lot of non-profits working and enabling, for example, providing hostels and other things. Um, but even if the school is within a mile, you cannot go to that school. Why? Because it belongs to a different zip code. Right. Uh, so these are the kind of problems that Drive really focuses upon. What Drive does is it works in with the people who are working on this cost level that that die with, with two adopted kids. Uh, that's the Korea project. Um, that, that couple I earlier talked about, that, that's the Shambhuna Research Foundation project in Varanasi. Um, the school project that, that I just talked about, the third one, is in Nambui Delhi. So what Cry does is Cry works as a link between the donors uh, and the volunteers uh, on one side, and it looks at the people who are working at the grassroots level who actually understand and know the problem and enabling them. So what Cry does is Cry, Cry funds uh, a lot of these non within India. I think there are about more than 200 projects at this point. Uh, who need constant support in terms of finance, uh, in terms of uh, uh, guidance, in terms of mentorship, in terms of lobbying with the government, uh, in terms of uh, making people aware about what are their rights, because a lot of people don't even know that they have a right to education. Uh, in fact, when India right to education uh, passed as a law, uh, Cry worked with very hard on making it, uh, making it accessible and making it get through. Uh, so that's what Cry focuses upon. Um, uh, Kai was founded in 1979 by, uh, by a guy named Ripan Kapoor. Uh, he was an air hostess and he decided one day that, hey, there's something that I want to do for society. So what he did, he, he reached out to all his friends, like, hey, everybody need to donate a little bit. And we're going to raise these funds and donate it to, the, uh, to a particular cause. That's how it started. And, and slowly we, we moved away to this model of like some, being a supporting layer um, and, 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 and providing support to all these 200 plus nonprofits in India. Um, Cry America is an offshoot of Cry. Um, so, so what Cry America does is it works uh, just similar to what from said. We also have like different action centers. Um, well, Seattle is one of them. Um, so the Seattle chapter doesn't have any board. Uh, so everybody's a volunteer. We focus a lot more on organizing events like Holi, Dadia, uh, music concerts, and so on. 
uh, and we raise these funds and we, we send these funds back to uh, India to Prime Rita, which sends it back to the client here. The money goes to a pool and gets equally distributed across the projects based on the funding. Uh, the idea is that we don't want to pick a particular project. But here's the problem. When we do this, uh, it's very hard to quantify those things because these changes takes a long time to reflect any movement. Uh, so in order to address that, we have looked into adopting six projects uh, and now we are funding completely from Seattle those six projects. Uh, so that's cry for you guys. Thank you. Very much. First, I want to say that I'm utterly embarrassed to be here um, because we should probably have been doing this for the longest time and we're just starting to think about it. But then I would also say that I'm really grateful for the opportunity for two reasons. Um, Viva CEO Hanan was supposed to be here um, and he happened to um, have a work commitment that was in conflict. So I'm glad there's one woman uh, from other nonprofits on this panel because Hanan couldn't make it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you can see where my inclinations are. Uh, I want to just start off with um, so I run the uh, team of marathon training program in the Bay Area for a few years now, it out. Um, and Asha's program has been a great inspiration for me. In fact, um, some of our coaches and mentors are um, Asha Alam as well. Uh, brought great inspiration to us, and I've been personally positively impacted by them. Um, so you have, and oh, uh, Asha Holi is my favorite event um, in the Bay Area in the year, so you guys just like rock. Um, I want to say that um, we are, um, when we had a, a Dream Mile, one of our events, and somebody from Asha said, can we have a booth? And one of our volunteers said, oh, we can't have an Asha booth at our Dream Mile. Why? Uh, from there, we've gone on to, we actually voluntarily reach out to the, our contact in the Bay Area and say, hey, three months coming up, you guys want to have a booth for your training program. So it's a start, right? Um, and Henry Ford said, you know, this is the beginning, and sticking together is the progress, and then money working together is success. Um, we're not very different from, uh, I think, the thought leaders who started these organizations were 25 years old as well. Um, clearly, we have like a narrow Jinnah thing going on, uh, but uh, we're not very different. I think fundamentally, we're organized in a way that aid is in that we have what we call mission control casualty, but it's more the board and um, the exec. And so I sit on the exec team. Um, I, lead, I led programs until last week. Now I'm running to uh, be marketing because our website sucks. Uh, but we also have uh, the chapters across, uh, we call them action centers. but. So chapter um, in the uh, United States as well as in India. Um, so we're not very different, honestly. Um, and I think uh, only the only philosophy that I uh, really, really generally buy into from a Vipa perspective is um, our informal vision is that none of us should really be doing this. Like the system should just work. So there should be no re reason for nonprofits or activists. Things should just work. So that's our informal vision. Um, our mission is to empower, educate, and enable every individual who wants to make a difference. So we are not talking about um, can we go like you know help um, like fund schools? Can we help fund uh, bringing water supply to villages or anything? It's more about if you want to help, what can you do? How can we empower you to help? And that's pretty much it. So it can be an organization, an individual. Um, you know, any kind of body that wishes to make a difference. Um, and that kind of leads, I think, to um, what we can bring to the table. Uh, what I love about our uh, model is we have a good exit strategy. We okay, all love having an exit strategy out of work, out of relationships. So we have a good exit strategy. <laughs> Uh, so we know we're really good at like what we want to fund, and all of us are really good at that. But we also know when we're going to say, "Hey, boss, look, this is really not working out." And so, if you're not willing to cooperate, we're out of here. Uh, it's really it comes out as really insensitive, but at some point, you just you gotta know when you're failing and pivot, right? And those Microsoft and Apple and all you guys know that. Um, 
And so that's really like what I'm really excited about. And that's something that we bring to the table. The other is I'm really proud about is our youth chapter. Um, I think that empowering them and educating them and, and raising sort of their awareness. My kids are like a no activist right now, right? Which beats the hell out of my parents. But uh, but they are really engaged in this. And I think part of the chapter is like uh, really, really um, trailblazing and happy to share anything that any organization wants on how to groom them as future leaders and, and thought, thought leaders and, uh, and actual executors. Um, and the most recent one I want to share is Innovation Hub. So we said, like, dude, I mean, we're all like, we're all such smart people, and we just keep doing the same thing for like 20 years, and, and then we keep saying we're not growing. And so we really have this, uh, I hate to see it's a like task force or tiger team or any of that, but, but that's what we are. And so we just have an informal bunch of people just brainstorming ideas and, and running them by mentors who may or may not be working with our volunteers. But, saying you don't want to do this and one of the outcomes of that is we did a really fantastic collaboration with a local school district in Denver because when an idea is good an idea is good irrespective of whether it's in India or Tanzania or you know, wherever right so um, so we had phenomenal success with the local school district in Denver um, really like a low income district and happy to share uh, results and learning from that informally after the session as well so those are things I'm really really excited about that I think Maybe they're not as unique, but I think they're unique. And uh, that's what we bring to the table. Thank you. So I'm sure nobody sitting there needs an introduction about Asha. I am hoping no one here needs an introduction about Asha. So I guess I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I guess Asha is like a mixture of pretty much everything you guys have said, right? So started in 91. Um, the same uh, chapter-based structures, chapters um, in the US, chapters in India, chapters uh, around the world. Uh, one thing we differ uh, in is that the chapters are pretty much empowered to make their own funding decisions. So um, the Seattle chapter decides what projects they want to fund without any involvement from the central board. So we have a board, but then that's just involved in administrative stuff. Um, so that's where we are. And uh, I guess I will move on to what the collaboration part uh, because we are I mean, pushing the clock. So one thing I'm very happy about is I think last year with Viva, at least we started one step of collaboration uh, where Viva was uh, trying to have the signature petition against the midday meal campaign. Right? Asha was one of the signatories. Right? So um, that was kind of step one of saying, okay, uh, together we present a united front in against one issue. Right? And that can go further in a long way, right? Uh, or, um, with the RTE, I mean, there, there have been cases where uh, pretty much Asha has worked with aid, Asha has worked with Viva. Uh, if I just look at the set of projects which uh, we which we support, uh, right, like Mandra Lions Club uh, is a project we support with aid. Uh, we supported the aid Eureka program in Chennai. Um, Viva and Asha support I think, a ton of projects together. So there is definitely a lot of uh, things which we agree on. And, and uh, things which we can collaborate on. I think what we just need to do is just starting, start working out the mechanics of it, um, how we can uh, get this information out to other volunteers as well, or how we can have a forum, uh, not just here, to kind of take this relationship forward and how we can build on it. Thank you. Um, so the next part would be the discussion. Um, so, in a simple sentence, if we want to make a sustainable village with our partnership and maybe other organizations too, how would, in your view, we could work together to do it? And it doesn't have to be in a year, maybe five years, but how can we work together to make a model village that work, that is sustainable? <laughs> I think firstly we have to recognize that a lot of village life already was sustainable uh, and uh, for example the tribals uh, they do farming during the rainy season and then they have a forest uh, for the other seasons right and the reason the life becomes non-sustainable is because the forests are cut uh, and then they won't be able to uh, I mean they lose the opportunity to survive without the forest so part of it is uh, recognizing I think what are the forces uh, that are um, uh, that? What are the oppressive forces 
Uh, it's like Newton's law, you know, uh, in the sense that I think uh, the life itself actually is the entire civilization progressive, not just that we progress, right? So there is a lot of traditional knowledge and there's a lot of sustainable things happening. But there are forces, global forces, that, uh, that are change, uh, that are prevent, I mean, that are actually causing that to be non sustainable and, and one of the th uh, things is to oppose those forces, you know, oppose those things, uh, so that uh, uh, so that uh, the sustainable growth can happen. The second thing I think is that the government is the biggest NGO, right? So the government also has a role, uh, and one has to force the government. Uh, and these are like low-hanging fruits, like due to corruption, due to various reasons, government policies are not. Uh, while policies may be good, they are not properly implemented. So using things like Right Information Act and things like that, ensuring that the Anandwadis are working in a place that uh, schools are working properly, and and the local curriculum in the in the, in the schools and livelihood and, and and things like that. The NREGS scheme uh, that's one of the biggest livelihood employment uh, generation schemes, right? So no matter what you think about software or uh, no matter what you think about uh, job opportunities. Uh, through uh, you know teaching people how to do tailoring or opening computer centers, the biggest employer is the NREGA program in India. Right? It's five billion dollars, and 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 it pays the minimum wage, which has completely transformed the minimum wage rate, uh, even in the, the private payers. Uh, you know, of course, it has not been so good for the farmers, uh, but then uh, that has to do again the farming issue has to be tackled separately because they need to get their minimum. Rights for their produce uh, uh, because the farmers also have to employ people to work on their farms now who will demand higher wage. So, finally, uh, you know, so that whole uh, cycles have to be understood, I think. Without understanding these things, uh, I think we can't uh, just from the outside uh, do something temporarily and expect sustainable change. So, we do have to bring up the awareness both of us and of the village people and use their strengths, like I said, their voice, their local knowledge, uh, and uh, and have a program to understand the government's role, how corporates, their positive and the negative role they are playing, and oppose the negative roles, support the positive roles. Uh, and, uh, and see, you know, and have a belief. I think finally, finally, simplicity and honesty, right? India cannot become, like, we can't have a consumer society for the Indian people, right? So, so simplicity, honesty, and modesty. Like, what do our people actually need? They just need honesty from others. Right? Provide that honesty. I mean, it should not be so hard. So, you know, keep that honesty as a goal, right? Yes. Can I make a comment here? Uh, related to this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, so I think uh, in addition to what what whatever Ruby has said, the most important thing that needs to be done is to implement the 74th and the 70, 73rd and 74th amendment to the constitution, Panchayati Raj, to make the panchayats empowered. So in India, we have the system that you have the prime minister, the most powerful person at the federal level, chief minister at the state level. But you when, come, when you come to the district level, it is the district magistrate who is not elected. So he's a bureaucrat. So at the lowest level of the uh, governance hierarchy, you should have uh, the, the panchayat, uh, uh, people elected in the panchayats, the jilla panchayat, the block panchayat, and the gram panchayats. So I think the empowerment of the panchayats is the key. Thanks, yeah. uh, before the rest, so I would like to rephrase my question. So I'm trying to take it in a direction that if we have to work together, say for example, we had a speaker from Uttar Pradesh, uh, project DSPS in Uttar Pradesh, they have no electricity in the village, they are supporting a small school. So if you want to develop that area so that people just don't have to find jobs and leave to the city, maybe example improve their agriculture or I don't know, whatever else. How can we over here sitting develop a specific area instead of going India wide? Just to see how we can collaborate with actionable items so it's not just a discussion. Sorry. Sure. No, um, I can respond to that. Yeah, good, good question there. So I think I, I see there's two levels of collaboration that we can do. One is here among the, in, the, in a chapter, we have a Seattle chapter, Oprah, and 
Asha and, and we can put our way on events and fundraising and uh, activities and those those are very tactical things that that, um, that we can potentially do and then there is um, the, the trickier part is on the field and, and collaborating on the field um, because we all have slightly different missions uh, and uh, and in some sense like I'm, I'm trying to find for example uh, a new location to build a hostel that can be sponsored by the Seattle chapter. And if that collaborates with an, an, a field school project that any of your organizations are working on, that would be that would be an amazing thing to make to make happen is you know, okay, this is a Asha funded school that aim for Seva build a hostel next to and, and the groups uh, kids. That's a much longer term thing, but that would be kind of in, in my dream house. Uh, so I'm going to say um, I actually attended a conference on Ideal Village last year in Stanford. I don't know if anybody was there. Um, and we had some really good ideas that, that people shared. If you if you showed up at a village and said, okay, we are here to help you guys and we're gonna make the ideal village. The list of things people want, and I'm and I'm not being elitist here. I can I've seen the list of this is like any product manager knows what the customer can ask for, right? We want computers and we want a playground and we want like a bus that picks everybody up, we want a tree. And then what ends up happening is that somebody gets over enthusiastic, they do this for a year, two years, three years, and then it's not sustainable. Um, so what came out of all of that is basically to say it's going to be by a very village to village basis. Obviously, we need to understand the dynamics of the village and to um, your point, sir, to see how much of it is you know, like the political um, influence versus actually empowering people. What I can say for Vibha uh, safely uh, on behalf of the organization is that what we can provide is we have really good uh, ways to do this research to understand what is the minimum viable product, which is like what's the basic thing that this village needs, um, and also bring in ideas for educare. So by that I mean if, for example, one of Vivas projects spent one rupee on having palm sugar added to milk at the at the lunch, and that increased. Um, you know, performance of students by 33%, that's an idea we can bring. So we can bring the, how do we understand what the village needs analysis. We can bring to the table, here are some ideas that's high ROI, high impact to the table. We can, uh, to your point, so we can obviously partner to support from a fundraising perspective. We can also provide this team when we get together a forum and privately our conference in India for nonprofits where they come and share ideas and resources. Um, and we can also provide monitoring. So once we have an execution in, together with everybody in board, uh, we have a very strong, that's in fact another thing, we have a very strong central project monitoring team based out remotely out of the United States, supported by the team. So we would be more than happy to provide monitoring to say this is going well quarterly for the next 10 years that we all agree upon. And then if it works, great, how do we scale it out? And if it doesn't, what the heck are we doing wrong and how can we fix it or maybe this is wrong? So that I think is what I can say safely that we can do. All right. Um, so I think the point where I would like to start with would be if we all get together and you know put together a plan, we put together the finances, we put together the, the, the things that we need and the things we need to make a change in a particular area. How can we think that the people who live in that area are going to agree to what we think is good for them? Uh, so it is really important that if we go ahead, um, as you make this an offer, I would love this to happen. Um, if we are doing that, we need to make sure that the local chapters are at board. Uh, I think the most important part behind education, behind uh, child trafficking, behind child, uh, child marriages is the sensitization of the issue. Um, so, so you need to make sure uh, that the people are open and receptive to the changes that we are providing and they agree with that. Uh, and that's a long term process, so you cannot expect that change to happen within a year or two years. Uh, so if we are going into a commitment like this, 
and I cannot speak on behalf of Brian India here, but uh, if we are going into a commitment like this, we need to be open to the idea that we are not going to get small down <laughs> one year, two year um, gains or or some sort of a metric because we are all very metric and data driven nowadays. That we what's the problem since the last one year, right? You are not going to see that. It's always going to go downwards first and then then upwards. It's, it's quite like startups in, in some senses. Um, uh, that being said, we have a lot of firepower here in terms of the tech expertise. Uh, we know, for example, um, I would bet there are a lot of machine learning people here who can analyze the weather patterns and can can tell farmers what should what they should grow. Right? Um, I, I can give you a small story here if you have a minute. Um, um, three four years back, there is a there is a there is a product called uh, I don't know what it's called in English, but it's called Juar and uh, Juar, um, uh, which is which is grown in farmlands. Some of it. So uh, no, it's not Jawar, it's, uh, it's something similar. Um, so so that product nobody grows in the farmland because it's a very cheap product, nobody wants it. But because of some national research, all of a sudden the price is spiked. So the something which was sold for three thousand bucks has now been sold at forty thousand, right? So the next year, every farmer decided to grow that thing, but the need was gone, and a lot of families went bankrupt. People who grew 40,000 wanted to get even richer, so they took bank loans and they spent all the money because they all of a sudden felt rich, rich and they thought they can replicate the success. Uh, as a result of that, two years down the line, a lot of people lost a lot of money just because they made they decided to go with the pattern. Um, so, so, so you need to get around those kind of problems as well, uh, which is make them make better choices, uh, make them trust you, involve the locals, and and then. We can do a joint fundraiser. First of all, imagine like doing a single dry holy or a single holy in Seattle area, organized by all the chapters here, uh, which is so that people don't now need to make a choice of I should go to the Crossroads Park or should I go to the Marymount Park, right? Uh, doing things like that can really help us. Right. The fundraiser would be for the project and not for our individual organizations, so we compete. Right. It's to collaborate. That's yeah. today. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things that we can also do to collaborate, I think, is to add our voice. The NRI voice is very important in India. So one of the things that's happening is the that is in the minorities in India, for example, today, the kind of treatment uh, you know you you would, uh, you I'm sure are reading, uh, you know, or how our government is, uh, you know, the Modi government is uh, like gone uh, escalating uh, the war on the on the on the minorities and. Uh, religious minorities and, uh, and caste minorities. So, uh, so one thing there is, I think, uh, a statement that is issued jointly by all the organizations on such uh, on such things. Because I think one of the common things we share are pluralistic ideology and not a fundamentalist ideology. Uh, I think that would carry, uh, you know, a message and is very important currently in the context. Then, of course, Meda Patkar is on strike. Uh, I don't understand strike right now and. Today I think is the fourth day. So if we could make a joint statement by all our organization in support of uh, Meta's and the uh, farmers that they have to be rehabilitated uh, before the dam gates are closed, uh, then that would carry weight than just one voice or eight voice. So I think uh, collaborating on that. Thank you. So I think one thing I'd like to add to all of this is what uh, Asha and Ravi Mathi brings is uh, cautionary tales of us sitting here and saying this is what we need to do. So I think, and I think Aviva and Craig all of us understand that it, it will need to be with the project partners there and, and it's going to be a long process. Uh, one good place to start again as I said would be with all the common projects we have right now. Um, so even before thinking of something big, maybe one thing we can do is uh, start discussing more on the projects we already work with, projects we already support and look at how we can do things collaboratively better. Um, and in terms of uh, other kinds of collaboration, the chapters in the US can definitely have a lot more scope for collaboration. Uh, for example, uh, Boston, Aid and Asha run a uh, running training together. It's called Team Aid Asha. Right? In uh, the Bay Area, whenever uh, Aid has a speaker or Asha has a speaker, we kind of invite the other organizations, everyone, uh, to kind of come together. So those things should happen, um, again, with all the organizations, and I totally uh, agree with what Ravi said that we need to present the United Front. Uh, we need to work with the mechanics of all that together. Just going back to the midday meal scheme, uh, for Vibar to come up with the midday meal scheme, it was uh, you know an executive board decision. 
Whereas for Asha, it was a much longer process where we had to go probe all of the chapters and say, are you guys all okay if we sign this as an organization or do we want to just do it as individuals, right? So we just need to iron out those kind of mechanics and get expectations, right, um, so that we can do this. And I also want to say that there's never too many holies. <laughs> if you want to have multiple holies, um, I love Asha Holi. Um, but I also want to say that um, Maybe we have a reach that's very unique to us, right? So potentially, and I'm just thinking about that, okay, potentially the kind of people that cry um, attracts to volunteer, donate, support in any ways potentially different. And so um, that is another area we can kind of like look at. I know this is like, it sounds like very broad, but what I'm trying to say is um, we may have some common um, audience in terms of that whole patron base of fundraising and all that, but. Uh, the end target audience for delivery is more or less the same or similar and how can we sort of then leverage that breadth of um, donors so that's awesome but please let's have more of these so yeah um, one other uh, way that we've benefited for example in Perseva as a new organization in Seattle we benefited from other organizations like Shankarai Foundation is just learning best practices. Uh, so for example, we had a, a big uh, fundraising concert a couple of months ago where uh, Shankar Mahadevan performed. And, and so we learned them how Shankarai Foundation did that show last year. And, and we can, so there's a, there's a lot of learning that went down uh, and just kind of around best practices and how to engage with their donors and volunteers and so on. Okay, thank you all. Uh, the next part, so I've, I sent them a list of uh, I, like, topics, so I'm just going based on that. So this is for the collaboration on the side of the US. How would we connect our uh, projects back in India? How would we connect them, help them on the ground? As in, can we have all the project partners from AID and ASHA be connected if they're not already, so that they can learn from each other, for example? So we don't have an order and yeah, that's been great. Um, I can say for one, but the priority conference we have uh, should not be just one like, oh, this is like all the past projects and they come to the conference. I absolutely think it's open and maybe we have failed in communicating that across our partners and uh, collaborators to bring that because I know personally that people have gone and said, oh my god, like somebody else is solving for a very similar problem um, and we didn't know when we were trying to reinvent the wheel, right? So that's that's definitely a way to start where it's zero uh, new left, right? It's there, it's going on. All you need to do is send this communication out um, from from the projects in India perspective. Uh, that's very no brainer. I have, I have one other thought, and maybe we can use your help with this, <laughs> is uh, uh, just analysis of uh, data, right? So if I, like, if I gave, if I can bring a list of all the projects that Aid for Seva is doing in Asha, I can bring a list, somehow just geographical cross uh, correlation of all that, where, where it is. So I'm going to make a shameless plug. We have openings for seven data analyst volunteers across. <laughs> this we're driving that big time. Uh, there's the quant side of it, and then there is the to your point of the the more soft side of it, which we haven't even gotten to uh, yet. But from an absolute uh, like quantitative perspective, what can be measured and what can we drive and invest in? Absolutely. So uh, at least in Asha, the kind of collaboration which I work with in our project partners is with just when you introduce them to one another, and then they figure out what works best between them, right? So I guess that's what happens in Vidubha India conferences, and I think uh, AID, AID also has a uh, project partners conference in India. Uh, yeah, we did have some, but not annual. Right. So, I mean, I think a great idea would be to have uh, some kind of uh, a collective project partners conference where all our project partners kind of Get to get to one place, and all they need to do is interact, and uh, they are they are the ones who are best, you know, 
best uh, equipped to figure out what kind of partnerships each of them uh, can do. Uh, one thing we can do at the organizational level is kind of see what kind of things we can leverage. For example, uh, can ASHA uh, partner with aid in having their RTI awareness drives uh, go to the villages where we support projects, right? Or uh, a Narega awareness uh, drive, which which are successful in certain parts of uh, UP where ASHA Trust works, and can that can that work in other parts um, where other project partners are there? Yeah, I think that that's a great idea. We could explore that. Uh, basically, there are. So essentially, our partners, we can uh, you know have people who are resource uh, people for uh, whether RDI training or uh, NREGA, and uh, or even aid doesn't do it with some projects, right? So usually, uh, aid is uh, more uh, depending on uh, the local networks that are there uh, rather than creating a aid network. Uh, but so we have not really done a good job of even networking our own projects with each other. Uh, 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 because like of some old NBA saying ki net amara work tomara <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know so that kind of explains us a lot that uh, you know we should look for local networks oh uh, no net tomara work amara so <laughs> if we if we create an outside network um, but but I do think uh, we have uh, so uh, so in in every region uh, you know. In the villages where you are working in, if you require some training in some aspect, we could see if we have a resource person in a local movement or group who would be able to give that kind of training uh, and motivate people. Like, you know, like a lot of activists, grassroots activists also can really motivate uh, people. Right? Uh, but a lot of times that would also raise questions against the government. Uh, so, so, so the local NGO has to be able to, you know, want to do that. Uh, then I think that that would be something that we would be willing to explore, and um, aid also has to do that better with its own project partners. Like we have done some of it, uh, but we haven't done a whole bunch of it. Like we have done uh, in relief and rehabilitation, we have done better, where Devati, uh, one of the organic farmers, who did a good job in tsunami, went to several other places when there have been like the cyclone Ila in West Bengal or flood in Andhra Pradesh, and she did her organic farming thing. So we have some success stories of those kind of thing, uh, but uh, largely we haven't networked our own project. But I think there's something we should do. Thank you. So we'll use uh, 15 more minutes and then open it up to the crowd. To, I mean, to the attendees for questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so. Um, coming to the logistics part, not to the very detailed, but for example, if we get a hundred thousand dollar budget from an NGO in India, uh, where say one of the chapters of Asha is able to fund only twenty percent or something, and we have our own ideology and our own strength, so we want to say fund only the students. So, is there a way that an Asha volunteer can come to one of your meetings or to your board and present on the behalf of the project partner? So that we save his or her time to answer the same question that I'm sure every organization is going to ask them. I think that can we that, make some uh, I mean, structure would, for that to happen? That would work for an eight chapter if eight has money. <laughs> the chapter of eight has funds, uh, which some chapters do. Because one of the things we are facing in eight is a resource crunch of volunteers to present projects. So if uh, Nasha volunteer already is, has a proposal, has a PowerPoint presentation, can answer questions, uh, then we do have to talk within aid. Like aid process is also pretty consultative, like Asha's with chapters and all. But uh, it's happening now within, between eight chapters, like one chapter presenting it to another chapter. Uh, I don't see any reason why an Asha or a Vipa or a Rai or any volunteer can't do the same. So who, how do but, we uh, contact also subject to aid having funds, multi from Seattle. Multi and DC. Yeah, it it be a collaboration, but of course each organization can decide for themselves if they want to fund or not. Yeah. Um, so so I think there are a lot of common projects between Asha and AIDO. For example, one of the things we do is whenever we have an ed education, I mean if we are working for example in phone villages. I think Asha Bay Area supports the schools there, and Aid have actually been working on tribal rights issues there, you know, like uh, for uh, schedule five issues. Uh, so, uh, so, but the schools part, I think Asha is doing, and we had approached Asha, and it's a, like a long back project with Ajay Kumar, 
one of the leading act NAPM activists in uh, on the presentation. So. Uh, in fact, uh, the suggestion by Pradeep, uh, you know, that there should be joint like e e Russia meetings, part uh, meeting of partners in India. I think uh, instead of uh, uh, because one other organization from the LA area, you know, I can uh, run by Prithvira Sharma and his friend. They also have their meetings right in India. But I think this is duplication. Uh, the 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 uh, uh, one good platform where all people's organizations and NGOs come is National Alliance of People's Movement. And some 300, 400 people get together from all over India. The last conference was in Patna. So I think a good place for Asha aid related projects and groups would be to meet at this place. Yeah, I so think that's excellent. Yeah. You will you will meet all the you know finest activists from India. People will also learn, and all your project business you can do on the side. You know, funding and sharing and all that. No, I think that's a very good idea. And, and that's what I mean, like instead of creating our own networks, looking at a network that exists in India and joining that sometimes can be much more powerful. And I think NAPM is a great example. I can think of one other thing, um, network like that I came across, just for information. It's uh, called Caring Friends. It's based out of uh, Bombay, Pune region. So it's a group of people who um, build, who vet these projects and they do really thorough um, checks on them, and then they pass on the projects to the other people who are funding. So they're just like in the intermediate, but all the checks, all the making sure to the last details and everything um, in terms of site visits and so many other things they do, and they do a very rigorous check. I've spoken to. In fact, I was going to invite the person, but he couldn't make it. <laughs> One such network that I'm aware of is Bry. Um, Bry has multiple projects across India. Um, all the projects are divided into four different zones, uh, north, south, east, and west. Um, and uh, they, so there is a similar process where they, they vet the projects. Uh, they understand what are the, what are the needs. Um, once the project is funded, they have to report all the how the funds were used every year. And if, the, if, the, if there is enough transparency and consistency, then the project gets funded every year, right? Um, so I can, again, I cannot speak on behalf of Cry India, but um, I would I would recommend all of you to reach out to Cry India, and we can have to connect with those folks uh, to see if there are projects that Cry cannot fund today, or Cry would like to fund but doesn't have enough bandwidth. Uh, and if you guys want to leverage it also data and whatnot, right? Uh, that being said, one of the big challenges that we see throughout, uh, and which we are trying to solve consistently. Um, is, is that all these different non-profits which are working at the Rashtra, uh, they belong to very different diverse um, localities, which means their data data reporting is different, uh, they usually the languages are different, um, the way they track things are sometimes a sort of paper, sometimes it's a, it's a note in the back of their mind, right? Um, putting all those things together in a, in a standardized format that can be then consumed to for learning purposes and for sharing purposes. Um, and I would bet like you guys are facing probably facing similar challenges in India as well because um, you cannot go into a village in Chhattan and ask them to now start using uh, Excel because that person has never seen Excel before, right? Uh, so, so how do you solve those, those problems and, and you know joining on those efforts could be really beneficial. I can say that we have a um, we have a funding cycle, so we're pretty structured, and we have a rubric in terms of how we what we do. So you, I mean. Ideally, it would be out there and nobody would even have to talk to anyone and you can go check, 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 think this is valid and that's it. But that we're not there yet. Um, obviously, you can go to our website and, and submit a request and somebody will absolutely respond to you um, within a few days, couple of days. But um, you can also reach out to me, obviously, and, and, and you know anyone. So what I want to go back to is sort of our, our mission that we want to empower and enable anybody who wants to make a difference, which means um, I've had friends all the time come and come up and say, oh, I, this is my native village, my grandparents they used to live here, and there's something going on here, or any guys take a look, and we have done it. So we're always looking for opportunities where maybe there's there's an idea that is working well, or maybe there's an opportunity for us to take an idea that's working well and we scale it out. So feel free to reach out either directly to me or Kanadi or submit a request on the website. And as long as it's within the funding cycle, then we have time to take a look and see the twists, we will do that. Great. Um, I just want to add, uh, so very similar to that, Asha has this uh, concept of Asha Stars. 
So if you have a friend who is not submitting something in the project cycle, uh, I mean, you could reach out to Asha as well, and if any Asha chapter is interested, that, um, that can be taken up as an Asha project. One thing I wanted to bring up though was um, the possibility or at least the idea of funding two NGOs in the same area. Because one thing we hear about is if we have an NGO which is working with the government and we ask them, oh, uh, why isn't the government doing this? Why don't you protest? The first thing we hear from them is, I mean, they're working with the government, we just don't want to antagonize them. Right. So it is a thought that, I mean, you are better served if you fund two organizations in that area, uh, maybe one through Asha, one through aid. One works with the government and one protests so that the next organization does not need to do that. So this is something which has come up. And <laughs> I mean, that's like a dangerous game that we can <laughs> uh, we, Because a uh, lot of things are trust based. So, uh, so you know, if, if there is an organization which, uh, I mean, for example, in a in an issue where this would matter, uh, if you are uh, funding a protest organization and another organization is uh, forming the uh, funding the opposite side of it. <laughs> no, no, I didn't mean that way. I mean, let's say let's say I have a project which is uh, adding teachers or para teachers to the school, right, to strengthen the school system, but then. Um, we can't, the same organization cannot say why isn't the government adding more teachers when the student teacher ratio is so bad because they don't want to antagonize them, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's, saying, I mean, the, I it's right. one organization saying fulfill the requirements of RTE, fulfill the infrastructure requirements in the school, fulfill uh, student teacher ratios as the RTE requires, and the other one is filling the gap in uh, while that is being done. So pretty ma mainly it happens when you know you have local groups that may not have a CRA uh, who are actually uh, raising the Sandersh part, uh, and then there may be a group that has a CRA uh, that you are supporting. Uh, now the way this would work is that uh, the group that has a CRA is sensitive uh, to all the issues that the local groups are raising and provide some platform, uh, you know, for them to raise those things, right? Uh, and so we would aid, would uh, support uh, such groups that have a CRA that are sensitive to uh, grassroots movement. Uh, because the government is uh, targeting, as you know, uh, a lot of groups that do not have a CRA. Uh, if they get involved with uh, foreign kind of, we will be considered foreign funds. So it does, uh, so that's how it appears in aid. Now you have given an example of two NGOs that have a CRA, one more activist than the other. I guess it would work as long as the two are sensitive to each other and work together. Uh, I think. So, Manish is talking about Yeah. A good example. Yeah. So, uh, Parivartan was not registered. Yeah. And Kabir was registered. Yeah. So, Manish is talking about putting all the funding which was required for Arvind Kejriwal also. Yeah. So, this is what we know. Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, Aid had uh, supported uh, Kabir, I think, uh, that has its yeah. We had a concrete example of this yesterday where BSTS was really asking for help in activism or, or demands for the government to provide things like transportation and electricity because they didn't want to engage in that because they were, you know, running their school. They can't afford to antagonize the government. So they were really looking for help for somebody else to do the activism. So it's a good idea. And from from aim for zero perspective, if that project involves a hospital, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure like many, we've got many such requests, and sometimes we don't want to fund construction, so we would come to you. <laughs> so I mean, this is actually what uh, something Sandeep was talking about yesterday, uh, where we were talking about a project called Apnaj, right? Yeah. Where they pretty much do the same thing. They have a hostel, and uh, so Sandeep was actually looking at trying to get more of these uh, because. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean that would be a very very good place to. Yeah. It is very difficult to get recognition for a school setting without paying bribe. So this is the next best uh, possible thing that we could do. Okay, I guess now we can open it up to questions, so okay. it's more collaborative with the attendees. Perfect. So twenty minutes, and then we have another. So we'll try to ask as much as possible. Um, actually, one is a suggestion, so I thought I'd pick that up. Can I suggest a concrete action item? Each of the organizations need to have a person acting as a point of contact for this group within this week. They can probably meet regularly to enable cross-collaboration. 
instructors leaving it as just a conference discussion. So that's a, so that's a good suggestion, I thought. As a cross. <laughs> I think that these people can be the initial contacts. <laughs> yeah, it's all of them. I can, I can scream. Scream. It's okay. It's okay. And then the other one is also kind of a suggestion, which I thought it's more futuristic, so we can just think about it. Did you think organizing a joint conference, India 2025, for example, would help bring awareness about what impact everyone? including non-Indians, could make in India if they wish. So an India 2025 conference um, coming to all organizations coming together. It, it, but, but I don't know whether the suggestion was here in the US or in India. So whomever said it just. I just put that here. OK, here. So India 2025 conference. So. Vibrant India, yeah, Vibrant India 2025 or 2020, yes, 23 years. That was one one um, other suggestion. And then I picked just one for each organization uh, because there's lots of questions that could be answered like for everyone, but I picked one for each. So for Viba, how long does it take for an idea in the innovation task force to get through the ground level and see results? So the innovation hub is three months old. It took us a month to get the innovation hub ready. So it gives you an idea of how quickly we can move. Um, we all and the first idea from that was the collaboration with the with the local American-based um, school district, and that happened almost quite real time as soon as the team was formed. Uh, so that's the whole point of it. If we weren't that agile, I don't think there's a point in us existing because innovations you know, pretty much. Uh, expire like ideas expire. Okay. To Aim Seva, are Aim Seva's approaches different from Akel's foundation? And do you see opportunities to collaborate with them? I, I don't know. What Akel Vidyalaya, is that right? I think Akel Vidyalaya is, is also focusing on education and true, bringing. True yeah. 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 Not too much, but they have their own methodology. Okay. Um, we can safely say that it is from. Um, like artists sort of groups. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I see that if there, if there are opportunities, schools or opportunities kind of adjacent to schools. So it, that is absolutely a. The reason I ask this is because um, their philosophy, their philosophy is quite different from AAD, for example. And we would not um, most chapters, if not all chapters, would not find that. Uh, if you, like, because it's because it's Hindu. Yeah, it's uh, focused on certain uh, it's religious it's religious because it's fundamental. Oh, it's that. Okay. Okay. If it was Hindu, it would have been fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they were yeah, sectarian kind of also. Okay. I I'm not completely sure about sure, that. Sure. Even though our like our form, our organization was also founded by Swami Dhanan Saraswati, but he's he's a very um, uh, uh, yeah. broad. Based yeah, that is different from uh, Akal from what it is. Adi Samaj is a progressive idea. Right. Okay, perfect. So one for aid. How does aid work towards bringing awareness about the grassroots level within folks in the U.S.? So I think, uh, I think aid has the history of doing that. So, yeah, Muthi, you want to answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, say, especially in Seattle, um, we do a lot of talks in Seattle where, they, they, for example, uh, we even uh, most recently that we had not came over and we had three people from India join us in our uh, fundraising dinner where people talked about topics of India. Similarly, uh, apart from the fundraising dinner, we also organized talks. Uh, not so long ago, Revati from Tamil Nadu came over and gave a talk on uh, farming and millet culture. Uh, so, uh, and I think we do send out emails to Sweden and Co. try to send out to Ash and Network also. So we, that happens quite often, actually. What happens is that another chapter in the US invites people from India, and we take the opportunity to fly them here and have a talk with them. Some of the talks are actually how to that in Microsoft. OK. But that answers the question. Yeah. I'd love to understand how else we'd collaborate, because right now, I believe that email gets sent out through our uh, contacts. So you can be able to for example, Prashant and others. 
Perfect. So we'll move on. Of these organizations, maybe not Vihar, you know, but Cry and you know, Aid, we have liaisons where okay. we uh, handle them. Like, uh, I think I think the point is, can we do this more? Aid is Aid does a lot of work. Like Jamie Bandla, who is a tribal activist, she could uh, recently. Right now, Yogesh Jain, who is a surgeon who works in uh, the villages uh, in Chhattisgarh, he is uh, uh, you know he is uh, in the US. So, uh, so speaker talks and the other thing I volunteers do is visit, uh, you know, is, is to visit uh, grassroots movements in India. So not just project sites. So, uh, for example, if the Nanda Satyagraha is going on uh, last year, Suresh Shrigar, like he just took time off during the Satyagraha time uh, to go and uh, visit the Nanda movement. So, uh, so uh, and like likewise, when India against corruption was going on, uh, a volunteer Naga he quit his job. <laughs> <laughs> to go back to India to participate in that. Uh, so, so I think I mean you don't have to take those extreme steps, uh, but uh, but visiting grassroots movements in India is also one thing that you can add. I just want to share. I, I just asked a question on how well should we collaborate, and I think I have one suggestion. For the, one suggestion is right now aid invites aid yeah, chapter it invites other people who are poor in US, but if Asha were to invite them, then aid would really join. If Asha is inviting the Asha members, so they will have stakeholders and and aid uh, so eight chapter is very big join because they are uh, from eight. That's one way we could do. Uh, another way that Prabhu is talking about in terms of visiting projects, right, is that we always you know we we can easily publish a list of projects that we we support in India, and we would love for people who go um who go who go back home to take one day and visit the project nearby. Um, and you know we, the report does not have to come from a volunteer a page, right? The person that we work with is sufficient. And uh, that project report is very essential for us in reviewing our uh, renewing funds for our project, for example. Okay, thanks. Well, actually, this answered maybe one of the questions even. What do you feel about having a collective registry of projects by all organizations? We can collect information important for the partners in India as well as information relevant for NRI partners. So this would, if you have a database and locations, common database and locations, that could be one of the one of the things that we can do. So that's a suggestion we could take, and then we'll reach out for implementation. So okay. So one question for Asha. Um, I believe Asha chapter allows Asha to fund non-educational activities. Is this still true? Do you see Asha expanding into non-educational projects in the near term? We do support a lot of non-educational projects, and I wonder who has that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing. If it was from an ASA volunteer, I'm like, what? I don't know. <laughs> because we were asked to, uh, I think, about seven years ago, maybe five years ago or so, we've uh, come across some project where we were looking for, hey, you know, can ASA fund you? And at the point of time, ASA was actually here to focus on education more than other projects. Right, I mean, so like said, the, the philosophy pretty much uh, can vary by chapter. So, and uh, it's also a function of time. As some volunteers move on, new volunteers come up, there's probably new funding philosophies in the chapter. So, but uh, Asha has funded a whole bunch of uh, non, non education related activities. Uh, and education is also defined quite broadly in the sense of uh, any kind of awareness campaigns, RTI, RTI, and all of that. We consider education. So it has the aid, uh, has Asha Seattle chapter from really in the last one year? Uh, you need to talk to Asha Seattle. What <laughs> 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 chapter you are from? <laughs> uh, I'm, I volunteer with the Stanford chapter and we have supported non education. We have a project that supports Kalkar in Kazakhstan for the water filter solution. Okay, okay. Yeah, this I is for. I want to respond to that question on the 2025, uh, uh, you know. Was something that we could organize together in the US. I think that idea is great because uh, I think many like the the mainstream development ideology is going to do that, uh, you know, for the mainstream thing. So if uh, if our organizations get together and organize something, it would be impactful. But we have to be very careful in ensuring that it conveys the ideology of groups such as NAPM and all in India, and how uh, you know like that we come to agreements on those. And we keep out the fundamentalists out of it. And in the board of the people, you know, who decide how that steering committee 
there should also be people from India in it, like people like Sandeep and others, uh, you know, who would reflect, uh, you know, that uh, uh, that kind of thing that different groups could suggest uh, members of the board. I think if that is done and we come up with a good name, I think that and if all the organizations come together on that and say this is a vision for real India and these are our concerns and uh, this is where we want to see India headed. Uh, and uh, and uh, that there are two separate India Bharat and India shining in their agendas are different and we are reflecting the Bharat uh, then I think uh, that would be uh, that would be a, that's a good idea I don't know what others that's great yeah. okay. Maybe we shouldn't take eight more years to do that and do it quicker. 2020, 2020 yeah okay so I, I have a suggestion. So these people organize these vibrant India conferences in you know, Bujaz or Delhi or wherever and bring all the NRIs and it looks that all the NRIs support their agenda. Yes. Which is investment. So it would be nice to have a conference of Asha Aid kind of organizations in Delhi calling it vibrant India and saying there is a whole group of NRIs which, which questions your policies. Yeah. In You mean in India? In India. Conference in India. In India. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so we should take that. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think some, something along those lines would be good if we do 2020 or 2025, depending on how much time it takes. So, I think the three things can be combined together. And I know a couple of you guys are taking notes. One thing is cross project group, first get formed, first share projects, which is the second suggestion. Then you know collaborate on site business and then in plan for either the 2020 or 2025 US or India. So I think that starting with just the collaboration, starting with the group formation would be a great thing. Start with the team first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can you? This is also applicable to everybody. So if the answer is yes, you can answer. Otherwise, we can move on. Can you take up projects in other countries? This is to everyone: Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh. Um. We so for Dry, uh, we are already looking for a project in Bellevue uh, right now for because we have this thing which is 90 10. So we we send 90 percent funds in India. Uh, we use 10 percent funds in US right now because we belong to Dry America chapter. Uh, there's also a Dry UK chapter. Um, um, I can I can reach out to Dry Seattle chapter in particular about this uh, about supporting a project outside of India or US. Uh, I'm pretty sure we as a volunteer group will be very open to that. I'm not sure what the legal implications of that would be. I think people who are more diverse because um, I know that um, even just to invest in certain states, certain regions, we've had to, to cut within India, we've had to cut through some of their areas. Okay. So uh, outside of India, it'd be Again, okay, that being said, that's from the organization perspective, but um, organizations are a bunch of people at the end of the day. Uh, and we have a lot of volunteers and a lot of people who volunteer for Prime, volunteer for Asha, volunteer for AIDS. So there is a lot of, there is, there is a core group that can always fund a need if needed. We can always get together to do something very quick, very small. So, that's, so yeah. Yeah, that's a really good. So I have a lot of two girls in Kenya because I grew up in Tanzania. So I don't see why not as individuals we can actually do that. Mm. But it is an organization. What Ripa has done is that. Or Sikshana um, has been studied by UNESCO for scaling out in Africa as well. So, Vipa's obviously core competency is like helping scale ideas that work and absolutely, but in terms of actual the legalities and lots of funding and yeah. investing outside. Okay. Perfect. Not, not for any Perfect. Okay. Yeah, for, for aid also, it's very minimal. We have done some relief work in Nepal. Uh, lately and a little bit, uh, I mean, the, those have been token amounts and sometimes they're disaster in the U.S. One thing though uh, uh, that was good in aid is that uh, there is uh, an association for development of Pakistan that started on the lines of aid uh, a few years back. So some of the Pakistani uh, students and uh, uh, people who are working here, uh, they were inspired by aid and wanted to, you know, start an ADP chapter uh, and that started in the U.S like some seven, eight years ago. And we helped them with the, you know, with the, how to get itself registered, what, what kind of checks and balances Got they it, would need to support to them. I actually wonder, Homer asked the question, they may <coughs> even find out that there could be other similar organizations working on behalf of those countries. So maybe similar conferences, efforts that may be going on uh, that may be publicly available also. So 
that could be an option. And there are groups, South Asia projects. groups that are also there, network in the US <coughs> yeah. for South Asian issues and peace issues between the South Asian nations. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and from Asia's side, it's, it's the same thing, the legalities. Uh, one thing we're not sure of is uh, because our registration, everything says projects in India, um, we're not sure whether we can even fund things outside. Um, and for working here locally, that's also a question which came up. Uh, what, what we do is the chapters tend to work as with the same set of individuals, but they just do it outside, uh, you know, not under the ASHA panel. So it's the same set of individuals working, uh, but they just do it as individuals, and uh, that seems to work out for a lot of chapters. Okay. Um, the There's an event coming up in which people would like to participate if they are coming to India. 5th of September, there is an India Pakistan Peace March. Starting from Sabarmati Ashram in Ahmedabad and going to Nada Lake on the Pakistan border, demanding an opening in the Gujarat border with Pakistan. Because that is the only state in India uh, can... with, with bordering Pakistan which doesn't have an opening. Okay. Perfect. So it's uh, two, two questions combined because both of them are similar. Um, what are the challenges of collaboration amongst these organizations? And since most of us counterpart chapters in many cities can be trying or can be, you know, do you think that we are, our models are competing, like what our goals are competing? Is that one of the challenges? I think it's uh, um, so one of the challenges um, in us collaborating is just that each of us have evolved in a certain way, each of us do certain things a certain way. So trying to find a framework where all of us can work together is probably going to be challenging unless we identify projects that we are probably already working on and then build on that. Um, in terms of um, the second part, I guess, is in terms of chapters which exist in the same area. I mean, I think the biggest thing they all compete on is just volunteers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. other than that, there's probably uh, everything you can do in terms of cooperation because, um, yeah. I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, I'm surprised very well, you know what I mean? Um, we all believe that all of us has a lot to give and you don't need to pick one organization or another. So whatever organization you are really connected with, volunteer for that, it's totally fine. Um, um, that we said, uh, one big challenge that we see is uh, organization updates. So we, we end up not talking to the other nonprofit uh, and end up having the same event uh, on the same day. And, and yeah, that that's results in a lot of uh, that's, yeah. like, where should I go now? Because I, I like my friend, but I also really connect to that cause. And like, now you're uh, so, so that's one, one, one area of challenge. Uh, another area of challenge I would say is um, there's a moral structure. So, for example, Asha, I just learned today is. Uh, very autonomous in the sense about the projects and how they get involved. We, on the other hand, are, are purely focused on fundraising and, and awareness part of it. Uh, we, we do not try to interfere with how the individual products, products on the grassroots are working, um, and, 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 and that can cause a little bit of uh, friction in terms of how we can collaborate. Uh, but that being said, I heard a bunch of beautiful ideas yesterday, and, and we should definitely move forward. I think, uh, from my perspective, at the end of the day, we're competing for the same donation dollars. So I mean, I, I, hear, I heard from our donors what I just donated to cry at our So we can donate to a project instead, and so attaching it to one of our organizations if we decide to fund something together. Actually, I just want to add a comment on that. Um, I just an example of. Uh, as, uh, so when we started in Seattle in 1997, uh, uh, Asha, uh, I think I talked loud in that. Yeah. Um, so Asha existed in Seattle for some, for some years. Actually, a folks at Sweden said, oh, I wish he had a long time back because he was wanting for a long time thing in school before he came to Seattle. But Asha was well established. Asha was raising funds, and their funds, um, the amount of funds they were raising was really high. Um, um, and we paid it as some funds, right? First year. But over the years, we've been uh, getting better and better at raising funds. And I don't believe Asha is saying that, you know, we are putting less funds. I think in Seattle, especially, there's enough space for, um, you know, Indian focused organizations funds without affecting other organizations. 
I mean, we see examples of the instances here and there, but I think the, the overall scheme, um, I think that doesn't play it. I think that goes on to a very big point, which is uh, we need to expand our donor base. Uh, we, we tend to rely on our top donors for the events every year. We rely on our board and, and the trustees. Uh, but but there is a there is a lot of people who are, who are growing up in the areas and moving to Seattle and and it's just for outreaching reaching out to them in a, in a in a different way. Perhaps we don't cover the type of activities they are interested in, or perhaps we don't cover the areas and we don't talk enough about, for example, Orissa or about the North Carolina, right? So we should we should just try to see how we can leverage that. Uh, one way could be uh, we are in Microsoft right now, so Microsoft has a lot of internal aliases for like Maharashtra or Bombay and, and those aliases. Uh, we should just reach out to them and say like, hey, what are the areas you are interested in? How would you like to participate? The only reason I became a volunteer was because I had a lot of free time and I had nothing else to do. So I was like, hey, what to do? And that was the first nonprofit I could find. Uh, and it's been six years, right? So it's sometimes just, just finding those people who, who want to get involved. And, and, and that's about it. And that goes to donors as well. Um, contrary to your experience, I attended meetings with six different organizations before I picked them up. Um, you got to be a good right? So, that's, um, but um, I think about this as every relationship we have is very unique. So, your relationship with your best friend versus your sibling versus your partner versus your parent is very different. Um, I have donated 600 hours to Vipa in the last year, and I've donated 15,000 Pratham. Um, so, my resource allocation as an individual in terms of time, energy, money, and championing a cause may be different, can be diversified. But I want to go back to the whole purpose of the panel and to say Snake's point at the beginning of this is that when we let's say we have we have a team and we say that we're going to do something, I don't know what that's going to be, like a project or whatever. And then there's the hostel and then there's the uh, there is the activism piece of it, the messaging piece of it. Uh, in, in the political empowerment, and then there's the piece that is like data driven analytics, concepts, and stuff. Then that's not too much of a hard sell because guess what? There's a lot of people that says, I would love to get like support something end to end, and we're like, okay, let's start. You can say it, right? That would be a great product to pitch to somebody and say, A, look at all of us, we're coming together and doing this. And B, uh, you don't have to pick and choose anymore. You can actually like own the whole thing. And, and I think that's that's a great thing. But even otherwise, I don't feel like we're competing uh, at all. In fact, um, Rahul who runs the dream, the dream Team Animal Program, which is very similar. Uh, actually, no, we're not as good as Asha's program, but for the same one. Um, volunteers um, and Asha too, and he's you know, mentored from so that's kind of where I see that it's really I'm very very optimistic and and honestly I, we have so much to learn like I, I'm like listening to these people and going uh, I don't think we know any of this right so there's a lot of learning opportunities so just, I and unfortunately to go ahead <laughs> just to add to that okay um, uh, so one other example is this is a recent floods in West Bengal we're trying to send emergency funds and stuff so we don't even need to restrict our collaboration just with like these five, right? We could maybe collaborate with some other international organizations to actually build some infrastructure so those people are not struggling every time. This is just a start. We can see how it goes. It could be a project, it could be an entire geographical area. But we have to aim for the moon first, we'll get somewhere. So I have one related question to the organizations. Uh, if you are funding based mainly uh, the Indian origin people, or do you also are able to message to reach American donors or not Indian origin? In, in, like is, how if you don't mind, it does, does not really. Yeah. If do you don't mind, kind of maybe we can do it during the lunch. We're going to have the lunch in the lawn, beautiful outside. So we'll go get there and get the dancer if you don't mind. Uh, because there's another project, I think somebody in online I'm already waiting to start after 12 30. But let's do it after the answered with each of the organizations through Wiki. And then um, I'm going to request Shailaja and uh, Snegu, uh, PJ, <laughs> with momentous to the rest, you know, to each one of the volunteers. Thank you.
uh, presentation and tell us in our next Thanks, everyone. Um, we have the next one coming up. Thank you for three minutes to pass. This will be my job. Amishka is a project with the project partner uh, from our theater team. Um, Amishka is in the foothills of Himalayas, trying to. Yeah. yeah, it's the primary mode of being the fun mode of teaching math and science. Party partner is online, Sanjay Gupta. She's going to present how they're making a difference with the help of Arthur Seattle. Here we go. Sanjay, can you speak? Yeah, Sanjay, can speak? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, Avishkar is a program of uh, science and math. We work specially for, for our middle and high school community. Uh, and our aim is to nurture curious, creative, and critical thinking citizens of tomorrow. When we say that, we mean our middle school and high school community and their teachers. Uh, would you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so where you see the star is where we are located. We are in Himachal Pradesh and Palampur, which is about an hour from Dharamshala. Okay, so uh, the problem we have seen uh, in our area schools and actually across the country is the qu quality of education. So what we see is basically uh, rote learning. Uh, kids tend to memorize the uh, concepts rather than understand it. And what it does is because they really have absolutely no relevance, especially in science and math, no relevance to the world around them. Uh, for example, we all have studied, uh, I was just giving this example a few days ago, we all have studied triangles, right? We have studied the right angle triangle, uh, obtuse angle triangle, acute angle triangle, equilateral triangle, the whole trigonometry. But we, if we ask our students or adults why we studied it, most of us won't be able to answer this question. And when I go to schools and I ask our students, the only answer they are able to give is to pass exams. And that is not why it was put in the syllabus to begin with. So this is something, and because there is no relevance to them, that it actually becomes an exercise to pass exams. And because our teachers also don't understand, they tend to, uh, make excellent memorization students rather than students who can understand. So if you go out, if once they go out in the world, they are actually not able to correlate things. And on top of it, we hear from our school communities uh, that the level of motivation on the part of our teaching community is rather low. Uh, the teaching community says that they are overworked, uh, the our administration says that they are not motivated. So this is something that we need to fix. And the, what happens is because they also, the only method they know is the lecture method where they write on the board. And uh, so they are the ones who are doing all the work. And our students are just copying. They, their brain is not doing any exercise at that time in, in terms of solving a problem or, or understanding it. So these are the things that we see as a problem, and this is what we as Avishkar want to change. So our mission is to make science and math interesting, exciting, relevant, and fun for all. And all really means irrespective of any social or economic background. So all our programs that we do, uh, the community that we work with, uh, they, the community of need, in our case, is our underserved communities, and their language of understanding and speaking is English, Hindi. So that is what we do all our programs in. Uh, there is a video here. If you if you could run the first video, that would be great. Uh,
So this will get me the program encourages hands-on learning through models, experiments, experience, and projects. This is where teachers become the storytellers and the experiment or model become the props. Avishkar strives to improve the quality of education and make it accessible to all, irrespective of social and economic background. Avishkar has developed experiment boxes with instruction sheets to make classroom learning experiential. Experiment boxes contain not just one model or experiment, but a set of 10 or so experiments that fully tell the story contained in a chapter of science or math. It also contains an instruction sheet which shows the sequence in which they need to be carried out and then key learnings. Currently, the teachers use only textbooks as the teaching aid in the classroom. The experiment boxes will significantly enhance the learning experience in the classroom by making the class experiential. It will become a full mind and body experience where all the senses get engaged. How do we do this at Avishka? We achieve the same by doing three different things. Uh, we go to different schools and do demonstration classes using the R experiment box. Then we also do residential science and math camps where students learn the concept through experiment boxes with the aid of teachers. Do teacher training workshops on how to use these experiment boxes. It's extremely empowering when we truly understand the beautiful way in which the world around us works scientifically. Can we go back? Can we go back? Can we go back to the slide? Yeah. So as we said, we do three different things. We go through to schools through school intervention programs where we do science and math fairs and do experiential classes. Uh, the second thing we do is uh, we do. Yeah, go back to the slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, we do residential camps for the students. Uh, they can be anywhere from a week long to a month long camp where the kids, students are fully immersed in, uh, in science and math through a lot of experiments, experiences, projects, design challenges. And in fact, Asha Purdue and now uh, Asha at San Diego are also supporting these camps. Uh, we also do teacher training workshops where we uh, share with teachers what uh, the sessions that we have developed and help them develop sessions on their own. So, so far we have done more than 100 school intervention programs. Uh, we have done 14 teacher training workshops, 15 residential camps, out of which we had like, I think 11 or 12, which were a month long camp. We have also become a community resource center for our area. And uh, what we have worked with our teachers and students, both of them have actually gone back and shared with our their students. And we have reached out to more than 300 teachers and 10,000 students in the last three and a half years. Can we go to the next slide? Blank. Oh, uh, next slide. Uh, so the next slide. We have worked with teachers. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, so and now we have worked with students, we have worked with teachers. Now we want to combine the two. That means work with teachers to reach the students. So we want what we want to do is we want to work uh, uh, starting next year, we are going to launch a, a fellowship program, Avishka fellowship program, especially in science and math education, where we will take uh, a student, a I mean, others, graduates who are working as teachers or want to work as teachers and make a community of leaders who are interested in science and math education and want to take it to our students. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this will, so what we want to do, uh, 
uh, in this fellowship model is basically to build the capacity of schools by providing the support to teachers and actually create a network of such teachers with no support. So that math can become interesting, exciting, relevant, and fun. So before I end, I want to show one video which would kind of give you a sense of how these models and their training sessions would look like. So if we could show the next video. I committed to creating a joyful learning experience in our classrooms, especially in math and science. Science helps us understand the world around us and math helps us decipher this world. It's an exhilarating experience when we understand any phenomenon around us and share it with others rather than just memorize it. The aim of Hamari Kaksha workshops organized by Abhishkar have been just this. Go to the basic principles of concepts, develop a clarity, and learn various ways through which we can take it to our classrooms. To deliver a content, it's very important to understand our students, where they come from, what are they thinking, what is their context, and how can we draw from their context to make the content relevant to them. The concept may be universal in nature, but unless we make the student connect with it, we will not reach our students. We at Avishkar have been working intensely on making the delivery of each topic of science and math at school level conceptually clear, engaging, visual, contextual, and relevant for our students and their teachers. In these workshops, we deliver some of these sessions of science and math. We also discuss how we develop each of these sessions. Our aim is to share with the teachers and educators what we do. And how do you Hello. Sandhya, can you hear me? Hello. Sandhya, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi, this is Rohit, by the way. I'm sorry. Hello, uh, hello. Uh, we had to uh, stop the video in between because uh, we are already running behind the schedule in the conference. So I just uh, want to. Okay. okay, that's fine. I just wanted to make a comment here. Uh, I'm the project steward for this project along with uh, Kanika and uh, we thought this was a very uh, inspiring story to share uh, especially because uh, like all of us, uh, Sandhya used to work here, she completed her PhD here in the US she worked for 15 years uh, uh, in a farm in Minnesota and uh, from there uh, somehow she had a roots back in India and she wanted to make an impact so one day she and her husband just uh, decided that they were done with this life and that they wanted to make impact on the grassroots in India and then they randomly choose a place on the map because that, that is what she told me that they randomly choose this uh, place in the foothills of Himalaya and uh, they just started working there. They had a little daughter of their own. They wanted to provide quality education for her and then they said let's start home school in her. And then somehow that evolved into an idea of you know providing a different type of education to all children around them. So I thought this was a very inspiring story to share. And uh, uh, they, uh, so if anyone is visiting India and they would like to spend some time, a few days in the foothills of Himalayas, I think uh, Sandhya is always uh, willing to host people. She has a very nice place in Palampur. And that is also where they work right now. So if anyone is interested in going there, meeting them, and uh, learning about the project or just having a vacation, they are welcome to do so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sandhya, I just, uh, and Sandhya and uh, I have that Sandhya and Sandeep they actually worked for a while together at the Sambhavya Institute, uh, uh, this, like, where they debate on policies. So Sandhya, Sandeep is here as well. Uh, I, I think you would just Namaste. Like, Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. 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 So, uh, uh, you probably know, Sandhya, that uh, there is a person called Manish Jain who. Ah, uh, Manish. Uh, Konsawala. 
शिक्षांतर वाला या गांधीनगर वाला गांधीनगर वाला तो वो If you want to organize these things at at large scale, like he has trained all the teachers in Chhattisgarh now, all the 28 districts. So he used to work with a person called Arvind Gupta, who was a pioneer in this field. I think I'm good graduate. He has books like the Arts in Jugaad. So Manish uh, <laughs> Jain is now an employee at IIT Gandhi Nagar. And any any of the projects who would like to use his services, I don't think he will charge any fees because he gets a salary from IIT. He can go anywhere in the country and train teachers on a large scale. Thank you. 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 Thank you Co-sponsored by Asher Sandhya, Ruth Sandhya, and Oh Jan, both of them are providing the project. Thank you both for getting us a beautiful project here. Uh, with that, we'll start the first session and take a break for lunch in the last. So guys, for lunch, we can get out from the door. Yes, on the yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you. Thank you. I will call you later. Bye. How? Yeah.